Welcome, everybody. Uh, the chairs on the dais, uh, colleagues who are online uh, remotely. And so we're going to call roll just to make sure we got everybody with a screen that's working. Uh, Tony? Owen? Here. Roscoe? Present. Davis? Here. Esparza? Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Mahan? Here. Jones? Present. Licardo? Present. Do you have a form? All right, thank you. Uh, we're all here to discuss gun violence prevention, and uh, I think this came from a memorandum that was authored by Councilmember Prowls, I think co signed by several of us. Uh, to investigate uh, other ways, in addition to the ones that we've already ventured on, to reduce gun violence in our community. And I really want to thank uh, the people who are sitting in the box uh, to, I guess, my right, uh, for all their hard work. Many of them have been doing this for their careers, and we're grateful to them for their service to their community. And I know we also have some experts who have been convened, in addition to these experts um, uh, who have been working in our community, uh, and I want to thank Sarah uh, Sarate and the entire team for putting this together. Uh, Sarah, should I be handing this off to you? Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, the presentation's coming up. I'll just get started while it's going up. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor, Council members, and members of the public. My name is Sarah Sarate, Director of the Office of Administration, Policy, and Intergovernmental Relations. I'm joined by my colleague, Peter Hamilton, Assistant to the City Manager, and a number of esteemed guests that I'll introduce throughout the presentation. Uh, this is not the full slide. Today's study session focuses on gun violence from a public health perspective and has been organized to provide the audience with both a macro and local perspective of gun violence. To do so, we've invited some of the nation's leading experts on prevention of gun violence, as well as local practitioners that are working to address our local challenges every day. It'll be just a moment to get the slides up. Thank you. Our apologies. And approaching this issue from a public health perspective is critical as more than 45,000 people were killed by gun violence in 2020, the highest number ever recorded. In fact, more people were killed by gun violence in 2020 than by car crashes. These deaths represent the destruction, both physical and psychological, of individual lives, families, and communities. And while the burden of this violence is felt across society as a whole, there are racial disparities in gun violence. Indeed, Black Americans and Black males specifically are especially disproportionately victims of gun homicide. Black males between ages 15 to 34 were over 20 times more likely to be a victim of gun violence than their white counterparts. This disproportionality also extends to American Indian and Alaskan Native people and the Latino, Latina, and Latinx communities. Understanding that population level harms exist, a public health approach becomes essential to apply large scale interventions that can decrease the likelihood of premature death or injury. This approach brings together different stakeholders to help define and monitor the problem through the systemic use of data collection, identify risk factors that lead to gun violence, and protective factors that reduce gun violence, 
These can be at the individual, community, and social level. Developing and testing prevention strategies that can be implemented through policies and programs, and also ensuring widespread adoption of those strategies that prove effective through evaluations. I'll now be turning it over to our keynote speaker, Dr. Daniel Webster, the Bloomberg Professor of American Health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, the largest school of public health in the world. Dr. Webster serves as co-director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions and is one of the nation's leading experts on firearm policy and the prevention of gun violence. He's co-editor and contributor to Reducing Gun Violence in America, Informing Policy with Evidence and Analysis, and he has published numerous articles on firearm policy, the prevention of gun violence, intimate partner violence, and youth violence prevention. He studied the effects of a variety of violence prevention interventions, including firearm and alcohol policies, policing strategies, street outreach, and conflict mediation, and school-based curricula. And with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Webster. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, really thrilled to be with you today. Um, I would like to share my screen with my slides. I added just a few additional pieces to fill out some uh, information uh, about mass shootings that I, I wanted to incorporate. Uh, so I am going to try to do that now. Um, okay. Can someone let me know whether you're seeing my screen? We're seeing your screen. Thank you. Okay, super. Thank you very much. Let me just, just one other thing here. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've been uh, teaching and doing research on public health approaches uh, to address gun violence for about 30 years. I'm going to give you a very quick overview on some key, uh, key kinds of data, but also ways to think about the problem of gun violence. Uh, it's already been mentioned, uh, sort of the um, enormous public health burden of gun violence. Uh, I just wanted to recognize that uh, the most common form of firearm death is actually suicide in the United States. That's true for most communities and states. Um, so over 24,000 suicide deaths. I'm going to focus more of my attention, however, on homicides and interpersonal violence. But you'll see, particularly as it relates to mass shooting, that um, they're connecting pieces to suicide, suicidality as well. Uh, while mass shootings account for a very small percentage of overall gun violence, it's estimated about 1% or so, uh, it's still very important uh, with respect to uh, the social costs connected to uh, mass shootings. I want to acknowledge that um, <clears throat> There's a lot of different data that are used to um, look at this problem. Uh, the FBI has a system of uh, uh, collecting data from local law enforcement. Um, unfortunately, that has important gaps that um, limit uh, how complete the, the data are. And it also makes it difficult to sort of pin down certain things, particularly when you're thinking about victim and offender relationships. The Gun Violence Archive um, is another source that's being used recently, including in our own research. Um, this uh, is more limited to more recent years, 2014 moving forward. And in that uh, database, they, re they identify or define mass uh, shootings as four or more victims shot, whether it's fatal or not. And then there's a very large publicly um, financed uh, through the National Institute of Justice project looking at fatal mass shootings in public settings. Now, that's an important distinction and narrowing of this problem. When my colleagues, Lisa Geller um, uh, being the lead researcher, 
looked at the gun violence archive data and looked at uh, incidents of four or more fata fatalities, uh, domestic violence was very prominent in um, o over um, almost 60% uh, involved um, a domestic situation in which family members were killed or intimate partners were killed. And another 10% involved individuals uh, with a history of domestic violence. So domestic violence is common uh, uh, in the backgrounds of the individuals and in the motivations of fatal mass shootings. When you look at the violence um, projects data on fatal mass shootings in public places, mental health becomes a little larger part of the puzzle or part of the problem. Um, yeah, but still, I think it has a, a relatively small share uh, in which severe mental illness like psychosis comes into play. Uh, there you have uh, less than a, a third of the cases of some degree uh, in which it played a role. However, suicidality is incredibly common. Um, uh, the mass shooters were suicidal prior to the events in 30% of these incidents, and um, nearly 60% died at the scene, usually at their own hands. Um, what is very common is some sort of crisis, personal crisis in the lives of the individuals who carry out these mass shootings. And there are often warning signs and this provides opportunities for prevention. And later you'll hear from my colleague, Shannon Frateroli, about the use of extreme risk protection orders or gun violence restraining orders as a mechanism by which to keep guns away from individuals when they're in crisis and might be threatening uh, to commit mass shootings or to harm themselves or others. So I already been noted there's gross uh, disparities uh, across race and ethnicity. I just want to highlight that here. And the other huge distinction is the degree to which the rates are far higher among males than females. Gun violence is very much a male-driven uh, problem. Uh, this would look even more dramatically skewed towards males uh, if we were looking at offending rather than victimization. I wanted to take a minute, however, to try to explain and think about uh, these racial differences and uh, sort of turn to a very classic study uh, done in Chicago with the most extensive data looking at uh, gun violence and, and homicides uh, across that city with very um, extensive data on uh, households and neighborhoods. And here, the authors of this study were thinking the th underlying thesis is that race and ethnicity are simply markers for external and malleable social contexts that different, differentially allocate by race and ethnic status in our society. Segregation is really what this is about that exposes racial and ethnic minorities to violence producing or violence protecting conditions. And that's honestly the way I think about it as a public health scholar thinking about uh, these disparities and inequities. What they found in this study is that lower rates of marriage um, among um, individuals who are black and parents uh, explained a large part of the um, uh, disparities. Uh, importantly, immigrant status was actually protective. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot of rhetoric around uh, immigration and violence. It frankly runs completely counter to the uh, actual data. Uh, more immigrants in a neighborhood are actually protective against violence. Um, lack of professionals in the neighborhood uh, played a big role in explaining these disparities. And then finally, an important part of sort of uh, the mindset of individuals who are shut out of opportunities becomes more cynical towards the laws uh, uh, in, um, and, and that's a, sort of a mechanism here. Um, but really it ties back to public policy and, and one most gross example of this is uh, dates all the way back to the 1930s and redlining 
uh, for neighborhoods and uh, ability to get mortgage loans at a reasonable rate uh, was done very much along racial lines. Uh, classic study here in, in Philadelphia, but it's been, been replicated in other cities, show that uh, in comparison to the, um, uh, the, the predominantly um, white neighborhoods, these other neighborhoods in, in the reddest areas with the most concentrated of um, African-Americans, 13 uh, full difference, uh, 13 times as high the rate of gun violence in those areas many, many decades later. Uh, so this, these are persistent inequities that contribute to this problem. A public health approach um, uh, is very data-driven. Most importantly, it's very pragmatic. It's public health is about solving problems efficiently and in a just manner. Um, it's focused on changing unhealthy and unsafe environments as well as behaviors. And in order to do that, you have to think about reforming systems, not only criminal justice systems, but housing, education, and otherwise, and think about what are the conditions that lead to uh, the problem. We need smart laws and enforcement to advance gun violence, um, but we want to minimize the harms associated with those systems. Uh, there are some in public health who sort of lead law enforcement out of the equation. Uh, that's not my own orientation. Um, I uh, engage with law enforcement. It is uh, in a society where we have more guns than people. Um, Law enforcement will need to play some role in addressing the problem of gun violence. We just simply need to do it in a different way that minimizes harms, costs, and inequities. Um, and then lastly, um, the effort should be highly targeted, uh, invest and support individuals in the neighborhoods that are of greatest risk. I want to just sort of give an example uh, that uh, I think localities should should follow in order to have this pragmatic, data di driven uh, ap approach to addressing gun violence. Holding up uh, the city of Milwaukee and, and their homicide review commission, uh, an approach that's been replicated in many other places. Uh, it's a, a collaborative endeavor to bring forward very rich detailed data about all of these incidents and the individuals involved in a manner to not just have data for data's sake, but actually to inform decision making uh, uh, involving community, law enforcement, and other city agencies, as well as social service providers. Um, so this is a process to help uh, drive strategy, develop data-informed prevention uh, strategies, and focus your efforts on prevention and, and intervention. I mentioned that uh, public health approaches are, are geared towards changing the conditions that uh, facilitate or enable gun violence. One of those conditions is urban blight. There's been a number of studies that look at what we call cleaning and greening, changing these um, vacant uh, lots into uh, really nice green spaces for communities. Um, very minimal cost uh, reduces gun violence by 8% in one study. And again, this has been replicated in other places as well. Somewhat more costly uh, intervention approach, but with a still a very high return um, uh, cost benefit in terms of uh, uh, reducing gun violence is fixing up abandoned buildings uh, in, uh, um, before so that they um, don't lead to more blight in a neighborhood. Uh, one study found a 39% reduction um, in uh, associated with this type of strategy. And again, this has been replicated in other places as well. Um, Philadelphia is a place that's done a lot of these sorts of interventions, and another approach was to um, have a special grant program for low-income uh, homeowners to keep up with the structural repairs so that those homes did not decrease their value and ultimately become vacant and um, help drive down 
um, investments in the community. Those uh, that grant program was uh, associated with declines of in um, assaults, robberies, and homicides, about um, twenty percent or more, um, and um, violent crime rates were. Um, connecting this to sort of foreclosures, which is the bad outcome, uh, the study found that uh, crime, violent crime was 19% higher in those areas uh, after uh, homes are foreclosed and become vacant. Alcohol is a very important contributor to gun violence, although it's rarely mentioned when people talk about the problem of gun violence. There are a variety of strategies to address this connection of alcohol abuse and gun violence. Um, one is through um, uh, increasing taxes to reduce consumption. Um, there's a large public safety benefit because alcohol has affects a lot of outcomes, car crashes in particular. Um, the proportional effect or percentage effect on gun violence is relatively small, but again, because gun violence is so costly, uh, it is is a beneficial uh, cost beneficial to do so. Uh, somewhat more um, targeted uh, and high return in terms of gun violence are um, uh, reducing uh, uh, alcohol availability in high risk situations. Um, some uh, in some type of sporting events is one one example. Um, I want to uh, turn to problematic alcohol outlets. A number of studies have found uh, across the country and in the world that highly concentrated uh, a great number of alcohol outlets um, are associated with more violence. Um, one of the things that uh, is um, associated with uh, reducing uh, alcohol-related violence is um, is um, restricting uh, sales hours, particularly uh, in the middle of the night. Um, one such such example uh, came from a study in Brazil, where uh, a very substantial reduction in homicides occurred, coincident with the. Um, um, banning of alcohol sales in the wee hours of the night. Another important condition as it relates to the environmental conditions that drive violence, of course, is uh, gun, gun sales, but particularly gun sales by um, what I'll just refer to as problem dealers. Uh, research has shown that about 1% of licensed dealers account for 57% of guns connected to crime. Uh, we know that gun dealers play a prominent role in gun trafficking. And in a study we did in Baltimore, we found that 31% of the individuals active in the underground market uh, knew certain gun shop employees would sell guns off the books. Um, and um, there, there was well known that there were places you could get guns without background checks. Uh, we've done studies over a span of number of years looking at regulation and oversight of gun shops. We find that in states with um, the uh, most comprehensive regulations and oversight uh, have lower rates of, of an indicator of diversion of guns for criminal use. We also find uh, that in places, uh, cities that have sued problematic gun dealers for their practices, we track a very substantial reduction in the flow of guns from dealers into criminal use shortly after a retail sale, uh, as much as 62% in Chicago and in New York City, an 82% reduction in the specific dealers who were sued uh, by the city. Um, another study uh, from, from Milwaukee found that even publicizing data on which dealers were the problematic ones led to a substantial reduction in the flow of guns for use in crime. 
This occurred in the late 1990s in, in Milwaukee. Uh, a dealer there was identified as the nation's number one seller of gun uh, of crime guns. Within a week, they changed their practices, and you can see uh, overnight you have a, like a 77% reduction in flow of guns coming from that shop for criminal use. When Congress, rather than act to address the gun dealers, uh, simply blocked the um, data to publicize which were your problem dealers, we saw a 200% increase in guns coming from this problematic gun shop, Badger Guns and Ammo. A common public health strategy um, involves uh, uh, street outreach to individuals at highest risk for involvement, either as victims or, or offenders in gun violence, with people uh, within those communities who have lived similar lives as those individuals to build trusting relationships and then to promote nonviolent responses to conflicts um, and to actually do conflict mediation themselves, as well as generally promote uh, nonviolence through community mobilization and public education. This has been a, a approach that's been studied in a number of cities. Two studies from Chicago found favorable reductions in most, but not, not all neighborhoods. Philadelphia also found a 30% uh, reduction in shootings in the areas um, with these programs. Um, a recent study in Trinidad Tobago also showed um, notable reduction in shootings. New York City has probably invested the most in terms of the intensity of this intervention, and there are um, several uh, uh, neighborhood studies showing reductions in gun violence associated with this intervention. Uh, I've led research in, in Baltimore over a number of neighborhoods. Uh, this is some of our most recent work looking at um, uh, cure violence interventions in Baltimore uh, in places where the program's been in place for at least four years. You see significant reductions in homicides uh, in those cities, at least within the first uh, four years the program is, is implemented. However, we did see that there was a deterioration. There was a deterioration, excuse me, in those effects in many of the communities over a longer period of time. It underscores the importance of effective investment management of those uh, programs. And quite frankly, in Baltimore, those were neglected um, in in many instances. Another strategy that was actually born in, in California, um, Devon Bogans was uh, um, sort of uh, developer of this approach in Richmond, California, now uh, has program referred to as Advanced Peace, uh, where they have peace fellowships. Again, it's geared towards the highest risk people, in this case, in, uh, investing in mentoring, assistance with jobs, other needs. Uh, to try to promote positive development. Uh, one study estimated a 55% reduction in gun violence enrichment associated with this, and there's promising data from Sacramento as well. Turning to gun policy, we found that um, handgun purchaser licensing is the most effective single policy to reduce gun violence. California has some uh, uh, very strong laws as it relates to guns, uh, but somewhat mysteriously to me anyway, is that the strategy we find most effective they have not done, which is handgun purchaser licensing. Typically this involves um, applying directly to law enforcement agencies, fingerprinting, some safety training requirements as well. Uh, we published a study in 2020 that uh, contrasted uh, what happened in Connecticut when it adopted a pur handgun purchaser licensing law in 1995 and what happened in Missouri when it repealed its licensing law in 2007. Um, what we found in Connecticut was over a span of 22 years, 28% lower rates of gun homicide uh, estimated uh, associated with that um, 
law. And conversely, when the policy was, the law was repealed in Missouri, we estimated a 47% increase in firearm homicide rates associated with that law change. Uh, it's worth noting, although I don't show it here, that we saw similar effects when it comes to firearm suicides in those two states. And we found in two states that just did comprehensive background checks, which California does, we did not find measurable increases. It was only with the licensing. The key mechanism here is reducing straw purchases or diversions of guns for criminal use. We found in Missouri, for example, a twofold increase in guns being diverted for criminal use um, shortly after the repeal. We looked at in Baltimore after Maryland adopted a purchaser licensing law in uh, October of 2013, uh, 76% reduction in this indicator of gun diversions. And in our surveys of the underground gun market also found uh, that people uh, reported it harder to get guns uh, in the underground market afterwards. We have studies that um, show that this uh, policy reduces gun trafficking, homicides, suicides, fatal mass shootings, and shootings involving law enforcement, both as victims and as the ones shoot, who are shooting uh, civilians. I'm going to uh, I know you're going to cover some of the recent Supreme Court cases, so I'm going to stop my presentation now. And I may have gone over a couple of minutes, and I apologize. Doctor, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate you uh, sharing all this wealth of research with us. I know that you have to go, and so Sarah suggested that we uh, have a brief uh, opportunity for folks to weigh in with questions. Uh, if you have some time left, do you have time with for us? Yes, that'd be fine. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Let's open it up then to uh, the council. Councilman Peralta. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Um, just a quick question, and you, you more or less answered it there on that last slide. But from all your research, I was curious where you feel um, you know we can can see the the greatest change and, and positive change in reducing gun violence, and it sounds like this this statewide um, purchasers, um, excuse me, I'm blanking on the, the title Purchaser there. Purchaser licensing, yes. It mm -hmm. sounds like that, um, as you put in your last slide, there may be uh, one of the, the best opportunities. Is that is that a good summation? That's my, my view based upon uh, studies we've done, and there's been other studies in California looking at, at their laws, again, many of them uh, well-intentioned and, and having some impact, but I think having the biggest impact, uh, all of our studies point to purchaser licensing as, as the way to go there. Um, How many states and, have that today? That's a good question. Uh, nine states have uh, purchaser licensing as well as the District of Columbia. Okay, thank you. That was it. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, you know, Tony, can you see the Zoom screen right now? I'm not able to see who's got their hand up. I have no hands up. Okay. Doctor, can I just uh, ask another question about the licensing? I, I was just under the impression that would be a heavy slog um, for states today legally. Um, are, just trying to understand if that's really a sure uh, option. I know right. California is, preempts us from doing anything there and be sure. interested in your thoughts there. Yeah, so um, prior to the Supreme Court decision this year, uh, there have been some challenges to purchaser licensing laws, but they've survived all of those challenges. I've been an expert witness in some of those cases. Um, the, uh, the, the decision in Bruin uh, was focused on concealed carry specifically, not on purchaser acquisition. Um, I and, and to be clear, and again, um, I think Professor Winkler will cover some of this ground later, but the justices did not dismiss and say licensing was unconstitutional. The, yeah. What they said was 
discretionary, discretionary issuance of it or based upon a, 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 you know some specific need. Right. So licensing um, can and should, in my opinion, can and should be done based upon uh, risk and safety considerations rather than on a special need. And I think you're on reasonably firm ground from a constitutional standpoint. Yeah, thank you for that. I know we'll, we can delve more into it soon uh, with a legal expert. Um, knowing that, that, at least in California, that's sort of preempted territory for us. Have you seen any, outside of DC, any local communities that have been able to do that successfully? No, because again, preemption is uh, is common in most states, and so I, I don't think it's been really an option for localities. But of course, localities, uh, you know, every major jurisdiction uh, has some role in in uh, advocating at the state level for policies that they feel they need in their communities to keep them safe. Um, so I, I do think that it, it is something that cities should put high on their advocacy agenda for um, changes in, uh, from Sacramento. Thank you. We'll take that nudge. <laughs> uh, great advice. All right. Any other questions from my colleagues? Okay. Um, and from on Zoom? I have no, but no um, council members on Zoom with their hands raised. Great. Thank you, Tony. All right, well, thank you very much, Doctor, for being with us. We appreciate that, and we'll move on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sarah? Yes, thank you, Dr. Webster, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Peter Hamilton. I'm an assistant to the city manager in the city manager's office, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next round of speakers. So if we can resume the presentation, yes. All right, so from the, the national context that Professor Webster spoke about, uh, we'll now turn to the local context here in Santa Clara County. Uh, and we'll uh, start with the presentation from our Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office, and then uh, move on to a presentation from the uh, Department of Public Health. And joining us from the District Attorney's Office is James, uh, James Gibbon Shapiro, Assistant District Attorney and Marissa McEwen, Supervising Deputy District Attorney. In 2016, Marissa was chosen to create the Crime Strategies Unit in the District Attorney's Office, a unit that is, that is intelligence-led and involves large-scale investigative projects. As part of this, she cre created the Gun-Related Intelligence Program that oversees the county's approach to gun violence reduction. James Gibbons Shapiro has been with the DA's office for over 25 years and oversees the Crime Strategies Unit, among other units. He chairs the county's domestic violence death review team and the annual effort to update and revise the county's domestic violence protocol for law enforcement and the child abuse protocol for law enforcement. And with that, I'll turn it over to James. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for having us um, in this really important study session. I want to start by uh, talking about what the DA's office does related to gun violence reduction. So uh, you just heard from Peter that we have a gun related intelligence program. And what we do is we use data analytics and intelligence sharing to go over every gun crime in the county to work with our partners every week on those gun crimes to look at trends and to try to identify the places, the people, the causes, and the organizations that are contributing to gun violence here in Santa Clara County. And our lead partner is the San Jose Police Department. And we're so um, happy and proud to have that partnership with San Jose PD. Our team um, has a uh, attorneys, we've got investigators, we've got intelligence analysts, and very importantly, we've got uh, the work of our liaison, uh, San Jose PD Sergeant Byers. And that connection directly to San Jose PD is crucial because it means as we are working with our analysts and investigators and figuring out the leads that connect unsolved gun crimes to now an enforcement to try to 
uh, get those people into custody and effectively prosecuted. Our work at the Gun Related Intelligence Program is not just with San Jose PD, but with community groups, the Gun Safety Violence Prevention Work Group, the Western Crime Gun Working Group, the Crime Lab, all these different agencies we work together with so that we can build out the local intelligence data on what to do to solve gun crimes and to work out strategies that are, as I said, person-based, place-based, and problem-based. I want to talk a little bit about what some of that local data is. So um, some of this I know you on the City Council are very familiar with. In the last 10 years, there's been an increase in violent crime in the city of San Jose, that aggravated assaults are one of the leading parts of the increase in violent crime in San Jose. And then part of aggregated assault, aggravated assaults is the increase in aggravated assaults with a firearm that we've seen here over the last 10 years. What we've seen also is that, and you've heard this from the previous speakers, this is consistent with national trends that San Jose isn't alone, California isn't alone, in having increases in gun violence across all the different ways that you might count it, from suicides with guns to homicides with guns to non-fatal shootings. We've looked at our local data, and we found it consistent with what Dr. Webster just talked about from national data, that the victims of gun violence in San Jose and in Santa Clara County are disproportionately African-American, disproportionately Latino, compared to those groups' representation by census data in our community. We've seen an increase in gun submissions to the crime lab. And what I mean by that is when police agencies arrest somebody who has been using a gun in a crime or have uh, solved a crime involving gun violence and seized those guns, they turn those guns over to the crime lab so that there can be a ballistics analysis of those guns. And the number of guns seized by law enforcement has increased really dramatically over the last 10 years. And part of that has to do with a great focus on gun crimes by the San Jose Police Department and other police agencies, but it also has to do with the increasing use of guns in crimes in our community. And part of that, um, I know you're familiar with unregistered firearms, privately made firearms, or ghost guns. The submission of ghost guns to the crime lab, as you can see, is an increasing proportion of the guns that the crime lab has been uh, working on because they've been seized by law enforcement. And I'm going to turn it over to Marissa now to say about this news is not all bad news. When we were talking about how to split up this uh, presentation, James said he'll start with the bad news and I get to do the good part. So uh, that's a good boss right there. Really happy to be here. Thank you for having us. And the reason that we're so thrilled to be here is because we really work every single day at our unit uh, on local approaches that are evidence-based and that are going to make a real impact in our unique population with our unique gun crime problem. You saw we have increases in gun violence, but we understand more about where that's happening and how to combat it based on the data. So the good news about more submitted guns is that we're getting more shootings linked through NIBIN, which is the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network. And that network linked shootings through shell casings. So this was a robust effort um, to make sure that we have universal submission of crime guns, universal testing, and that has led to a huge increase in the number of linked shootings, including many homicide cases and an overall of 305 linked gun-related incidents. Almost all of those are shootings, either fatal or non-fatal. That's great news. Those are all looked at through the GRIP program and it means increased prosecution of shooters entirely based on the evidence. So we're super um, happy and proud about that program. But it also means an increase in gun violence restraining orders. You're gonna hear from Lieutenant Donahue about how San Jose Police Department has a program to specifically use and leverage the red flag law, gun violence restraining orders in California. That is not by accident. That has taken years to build out, to draft policy, to have staff at the city attorney's office and at San Jose PD who are equipped and trained to use these tools. We, uh, my goal is always to double that, double that, triple that. <laughs> I'm on, constantly on the stump um, to try and leverage this in appropriate cases where we have identified a unique risk of gun violence. And we do that by looking at all of these individuals each week. 
every week we have a dramatic success story. People who, uh, for example, two weeks ago, there was a call for service, a welfare check, a suicidal individual. He at that time was just waving a knife, but we learned from the tenacious work of patrol that he had a ton of registered firearms and that he had made previous threats of violence. They got a search warrant, they got into the house, a gun violence restraining order seized 54 weapons, including multiple assault rifles. This is the kind of work that takes looking at the data, connecting with the right people, and having the right uh, resources in place to go actually get hands on those guns and disarm these individuals. Where are the gun crimes occurring? Unsurprisingly, maps of gun crimes, which um, I know you can't <laughs> probably see this in too much detail right now, it is provided with the slide deck and hopefully you can kind of uh, gnaw on this later, are the same neighborhoods, not accidentally, that are the Mayor's Gang Prevention Hotspot neighborhoods, that are where we have a tremendous amount of community intervention programs because we see that there are increased levels of violence and specifically gun-related violence there. The data you're looking at here are all gun-related incidents that were looked at by the gun-related intelligence program analysts. They include homicides, shots fired incidents, gun recoveries, and armed robberies. Um, and the density maps are broken down by quarters. Uh, again, this is in the slide deck to, to, so you can play with it later on, but we see um, certain hotspot pockets um, centered, for example, in the downtown corridor, in Eastside San Jose, in Winchester Cadillac, um, and in some parts of the year in Southern District as well. What kind of gun crimes are the most prominent? This is based on our grip data. So again, these are all of the incidents that we look at and touch. Over 856 gun-related police reports were reviewed in 2022 thus far. The analysts read each report. They're looking for prohibited people, ongoing danger, people who need gun violence restraining orders, people who need to be prosecuted, a variety of different um, uh, approaches depending on the circumstances. We discuss them weekly with our law enforcement partners and federal partners for potential adoption. But overall, in the city of San Jose, what we're seeing is Illegal firearm possession is the number one category of gun crimes that we looked at, but we do have quite a number of assaults or attempted murders at 9%. Criminal threats, which we now have defined as our own category because we think this is such an emerging danger and a risk that we look at with increasing scrutiny over time. And what I mean by that is people who are making threats um, that previously um, weren't even being reported. So school shooter threats, workplace violence threats, threats against a spouse or domestic partner, and we now treat all of those cases very differently. They sometimes aren't prosecutable even, um, depending on the words that were used, but nonetheless, we take extra steps from the prosecutor's office with our partners to disarm individuals who have threatened to shoot someone every single time. And that's how uh, we train, that's how uh, we advocate, and that's what we do. Uh, just doing a time check with James real quick. Uh, my timer has gone off, but I'm going to keep an eye on this real quick because I don't want to go over. I promised them that I wouldn't, but I want to speak on each one of these. What can be done? We need more education. I'm super grateful for this study session. It's important for policymakers to see what's happening locally, also to hear from national experts. I think this is so awesome and consistent with the responsible leadership in San Jose that we're doing this today. But I don't mean just educating policymakers. We need all law enforcement trained. We need educators trained. We need businesses trained. It is a personal mission of mine to make sure that we host um, training sessions on gun violence restraining orders for educators and in the context of workplace violence for businesses so that we have people who are ready to call 911 where appropriate to raise the red flag, for example. But 911 is not always the solution. We also want to educate our community partners about non-law enforcement solutions to potential threats and how to intervene. So we had to do a lot of education in the gun violence uh, at, at GRIP. Prevention. We work very closely with prevention um, groups in the county, and uh, you're going to hear a ton more from the city on what they're doing, but the DA's office also is engaged in that work, and we support those efforts with our community prosecutors and our GRIP program, providing information to our mental health partners, to our, uh, our partners in the community. But intelligence-driven solutions, you also heard this uh, from the last presenter that data and intelligence are crucial to making sure that the people that we are spending precious law enforcement resources on are the right people. We don't want to deploy a TS SWAT team out to a house where it's not warranted, but 
what, what we say the crime strategies unit all the time is, I don't want you to cry wolf, but if you see a wolf, cry. And that's not trite. What we mean by that is we don't want to be calling for law enforcement backup where that's not appropriate. Sometimes a less in, uh, uh, restrictive or less uh, strict means are better for addressing a threat. But where we have a threat, we want to make sure that we have a process in place to deal with that. That's where we get to threat identification, multidisciplinary co collaboration. And here's what has been working here. Success is possible when you leverage science. We've leaned into the crime lab heavily. We have trained officers to submit all firearms so that we can lift DNA and prints, so that we can have usable evidence, so that we can identify shooters, so we can identify crime drivers. Leverage analysts, both within an, um, our organization, but also at police departments, at cities, at the county level. Data analysts are crucial to understanding what is our population, who are the people who are actually driving crime? Are we right or wrong in our assumptions about who are shooters and who are gr crime drivers? They absolutely lead to better, more informed decisions, better prosecutions on our side, but better investigations and better overall outcomes. Leverage California's robust gun laws. More gun violence restraining orders is my personal goal because I think that they are such an important tool that it, it's not an arrest warrant, it is a disarming tool. But also leverage laws, for example, for disarming prohibited persons. This is a huge goal of the gun-related intelligence program. In every single case, when somebody becomes prohibited, either because they have just been arraigned on a criminal charge or they've just been served with a restraining order, take that extra step to disarm them. That is often very difficult, but it is worth the effort in our view. And we have all the laws on the books to do this. Leverage the community. You're going to hear from our community partners in a moment. And again, we're really lucky to be in this county where we have community partners who are ready, who are um, are trained in race equitable solutions to addressing these and who work closely with us on these data driven and um, evidence based solutions. So uh, we are really grateful to talk a little bit about what we do. I hope I'm not over time. Uh, but my big um, thing that I wanted to make sure to tell the city while I have everyone on the line is your police department really is um, incredibly uh, supportive of the work that we do at GRIP. And we, I mean, if I could like replicate my one little sergeant into an entire team of sergeants, I would, but I, I um, just wanna say that an incredible amount of work is being done because we are collaborative and because we are um, really trying to focus on the tools that work locally in our context. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you and um, grateful to be here. Thank you, Marissa and James. Um, I, sorry, I just wanted to butt in for a moment. Marissa, I know you covered a lot of content there, and it was obvious you had to get through a lot. I, I know you also felt the pressure of time. Was there anything you feel like you left out that we ought to hear? So I just hate to think we... I will say that um, our use of a few tools in particular, GVROs, I think I hammered that pretty clearly, um, NIBIN, these are um, proven solutions that nationally ha have been studied, have been studied in California. And I just feel like every ounce that we put into studying these individuals, every dime that we spend on um, analysts and investigators who can actually go disarm individuals, that is the really hard piece. Like that is the final um, frontier where sometimes we feel, I, I think, frustrated is that you have an individual who we've now done all the steps to make prohibited but actually getting into houses and getting hands on guns for people who are at risk is very dangerous. And that is a challenge. That is an ongoing challenge. Um, disarming people is not as easy as writing a disarming piece of paper. And so the judge, just the, it's not a, a meaningful until we can actually get into houses with legal process and we can get our hands on guns. And that is very, very challenging. Um, and but no, we're, we're up for the challenge, but it's really hard. Marissa, I just want to add one thing to that is that uh, gun crime doesn't happen in isolation. And we should be thinking not just about wh who, what did the shooter do in that instance, but we should also be thinking about where do you get that gun? And where'd that person get that gun? What's the flow of illegal guns into California and into our county? And what, where, where is the flow of gun parts for illegal manufacture of guns here? And if we can think about this problem, not just as a moment in time, but as a series of moments, and think about the organizations that are involved in that, we'll do better. To Thank that you. end, um, and, and I'm grateful to uh, go after Dr. Webster, um, and I always learn, and, and I think that 
one of the things that he touched upon is focusing on dealers and supply side gun investigations. This is a priority of our program and we've been working really closely with ATF and also San Jose Police Department to ask in every possible instance, where did you get this gun? And then follow up and follow up the chain to supply side investigations, which is what we call it. Meaning people who are building, printing or importing guns um, either from straw purchasers in California or more frequently from out of state. That is also a challenge, but it's a priority of our program. So. Great. Well, thank you both uh, for being such great partners to the city and in, in all, in all the efforts uh, we have on, on the crime front. Thank you both. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you, sir. I, I do have a hand up from a council member. Um, council member Mayhan. Oh, thanks. I wasn't sure if this was Q&A time yet or not. I, thank you um, to Marissa and James. Really appreciate the, the presentation. I, I did want to just ask on the specific point you were just mentioning, how often are you able to identify the source of guns used in, in the commission of violence in our community? How often are you able to trace it back? And what, what else do you need to increase that rate of getting back to the source? So it depends on which level you mean. If we want to know from the shooter or the person who just got arrested, where did you get this gun? We do a pretty good job of identifying that first level broker, right? But if you think of gun sales a lot like drug sales, what we're really looking for are not just the, the dealer, but you're looking for the major producers or the major suppliers of guns. We're doing, I think, an above average job in most of our cases of training officers and also following up on identifying brokers of guns. But going up to uh, up the chain to the major suppliers of guns is much more difficult. But we've done so many big investigations this year. You may have seen the news of, for example, the build operation in Willow Glen. That was not an accident that we were able to identify those individuals. They were all felons. They were building custom assault rifles out of a home in San Jose. That was a months long investigation. Um, and that was a total collaboration through our unit with San Jose PD, the sheriff's office and ATF. We have similar examples of trafficking rings that have been a collaborative investigation through our partnership with neighboring agencies. For example, we just uh, dismantled a large uh, Arizona based trafficking organization through uh, a months long investigation. Um, and we also had a recent success in prosecuting the source of supply for the gun that was used in the Oak Ridge Mall shooting at Christmas. That was a handheld machine gun that had been trafficked um, and provided by a repeat dealer and source of supply in San Jose. So these investigations are ongoing, but they are time consuming to get up the stream to the source. And they really require a dedicated team of uh, law enforcement officers to do so. But we're doing this kind of on the side of all the other things that we're doing. So as much as possible, we're trying. Um, but it is, it's challenging because these are complex investigations, uh, much like a long-term dope investigation used to be. So. Right, right. Well, it's incredible work. And it sounds like the biggest limitation is really just on the investigative capacity you, you actually have access to. Is that uh, right? Yes. Okay, got it. All right. Well, thank you. And thanks again for the presentation and all the incredible work you're doing. Let me just check in. Uh, Sarah, I think I violated the protocol here by going to questions. <laughs> Um, thank, thank you so much, Mayor. Um, yeah. So Marissa and James will be available uh, along with all of our other speakers at the end of the presentations. Okay, we'll, we'll hold the questions then going forward. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, James. Thank you, Marissa, for your presentations, um, providing that rich context of what gun crime looks like locally. We'll be turning our attention now um, to back to public health in Santa Clara County to talk a little bit about the cost of gun violence here locally. Um, Mayor, we did build in a five minute break in case you needed that. Would you like to keep going? Up? Was this that moment? This was it. This is the moment. But I think I think we're OK to plug ahead. What do you guys think? Super. OK. Thank you very much. So we'll turn now to Rhonda McClinton Brown, director of the Healthy Communities Branch in Santa Clara County Public Health Department. Rhonda has more than 25 years in community health. Before joining the county, she was executive director from Community Health Partnership and executive director of the Office of Community Health at Stanford School of Medicine. In 2012, Rhonda received the Inspiring Change Leadership Award for her exceptional commitment and ability to enhance the health and well-being of her local communities. We're grateful to have Rhonda with us and I'll turn it over to her now. Good afternoon. 
Good afternoon, Doctor. I'm just waiting for the the slide deck to transition. Thank you, Rhonda. It's taking it's a little bit behind here. That's okay. Here just go. while we're waiting to um, change the slides, I do um, want to let you know that I'm not sure that I'll be able to stay on the call. Um, afterwards, I think I also have to leave uh, for another deadline the public health department is working on today. Um, Annie Wu is with me and she will be presenting on a place based strategy uh, later in the um, in the presentations, um, but I while I'm here I'm happy to answer any questions or uh, you can feel free to uh, send me questions afterwards and I'm happy uh, to try to answer them. Great, thank you. Here we are. There we go. So I just want to start off uh, by saying that this study is a long time coming. Um, as some of you may know, um, this study is a result of a, a referral that was uh, directed to the administration, which came to the public health department back in uh, 20 uh, in 2019, actually at the end of 2019, following the mass shooting in Gilroy. Uh, the Board of Supervisors asked us to come back with the framework on how we could study the cost of gun violence. We did that in January of 2020, and it was approved. And then guess what happened? Um, the pandemic came upon us, and uh, we needed to pivot and really focus our efforts on the extreme emergency of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we've been working on this study, uh, trying to regroup and catch up with ourselves for about a year now. Um, and so we are finalizing um, this report right now, and I'm going to just give you a little bit of the background, a little bit of the uh, cost uh, data analysis that has come from out of this report, and then uh, provide a summary of the recommendations uh, that we're putting forward um, to the Board of Supervisors on August 30th of this month. So you can go to the next slide. Um, just to uh, highlight a little bit, you've talked about this already, but gun violence um, is very complicated and um, it is the leading cause, one of the leading causes of premature death in America, as you saw earlier, um, and is growing nationwide. There are different categories of gun violence, intentional, unintentional, fatal, non-fatal, self-inflicted, inflicted on others. Some of the major categories that we really are highlighting are intentional self-harm or suicide, which you learned earlier um, is the primary uh, form of gun violence currently, unintentional harm or self to self or others, intentional personal interpersonal harm, and undeterminate intent. Uh, next slide. The other thing I want to highlight uh, that was uh, reflected of this study is we really wanted to ground uh, this work in with a racial equity lens, because uh, there are disproportionate impacts of gun violence uh, by race. African African ancestry individuals experience three times greater fatal police shootings and 10 times greater gun homicides compared to white Americans. Similarly, Latino uh, populations are 1.5 times more likely to die by police shootings and two times more likely to die by gun homicides compared to white individuals. And there's an increasing trend um, that needs further examination, further examination, but um, there is in increasing trends of hate crimes having disproportionate impact on people of color. You can go to the next slide. I wanna talk about our purpose and how we oriented ourselves to the study. As you know, the impact of gun violence extends to aspects of the human experience that's very difficult to quantify monetarily. Um, the cost is, is beyond the person that's impacted by the gun violence, but extends on to families, to communities, to those who witness shootings, to children who grow up in an environment of gun violence. Um, because of that, the Board of Supervisors of, in the County of Santa Clara really wanted to uh, examine from a comprehensive perspective the cost of gun violence to really quantify the economic and social costs associated with gun violence for a longitudinal period from 2000 to 2021 to help inform policy options and strategies to advance pilot, um, violence prevention. Pi violence prevention. 
the Board of Supervisors and other decision makers really wanted to utilize this study um, and point towards more effective policies and investments for upstream and systemic violence prevention. You can go to the next slide. Oh, skipped one. Is there one before that? Oh, no. Well, let me just talk about it a little bit. You can go on to the next one and I'll talk about it. Uh, there's a slide missing here, but there's a slide that has uh, six domains uh, that we utilize to do this study. And I'll just uh, call them out a little bit and they're summarized here in a more simplistic way. Uh, health and hospital uh, data, criminal justice data, mental health data, population health surveys, indirect cost, and local contextual data. And so um, we utilized those domains using a peer reviewed framework uh, established by the Prevention Institute for Research and Evaluation led by Ted Miller. Um, this slide here uh, simplifies the cost a little bit more clearly into direct and tangible cost, which includes the healthcare system, uh, which is comprised of medical treatment, processing of firearm crimes, within law enforcement and criminal justice systems. It also includes emergency room uh, and emergency medical services. Um, other public sector data is also included in the direct and tangible costs. And then indirect costs represent um, a loss of quality of life and a loss of, of quality of income. These indirect measures are projections based on a variety of frameworks that can be used, such as the value of a statistical life index, willing to pay index, quality adjusted um, life years index. Um, and those indexes are used to make calculations um, to project the, the indirect and intangible costs of gun violence. Next slide. So I'm gonna summarize some of the key findings um, and you can go to the next slide. Overall, as you saw in previous slide, the trend of, of cost of gun violence is increasing. From the years of 2006 through 2020, the annual society cost of firearm violence in Santa Clara County increased from about 950 million to nearly 1.4 million cost uh, which uh, which comprises about a 54% increase over the 15 year period. You can go to the next slide. This slide really highlights the, the, the total outcome results of the study. Um, and um, during, during 2016 to 2020, the average annual cost related to non-fatal firearm injuries and deaths were nearly $1.2 billion. The majority of those costs, as you can see in this chart, were um, in the quality of life area at 82%. Um, we did a further calculation breaking out these costs specifically for the County of Santa Clara public cost systems. And the County of Santa Clara incurs about 72 million annually due into firearm incidents at the county and city level. This estimate includes public costs in the following, uh, in, the, in the areas outlined here. So medical, mental health or behavioral health, emergency services, police, criminal justice. It excludes the cost of inc incarceration at the state and the federal level. You can go to the next slide. We also looked at cost by intent. And so during that same period of time between 2016 and 2020, more than half the firearm violence costs in the county were related to firearm assaults and homicides at 53%, with uh, the next uh, area around 37% for intentional self-harm, um, which typically is outlined as suicide. You can go to the next slide. We wanted to call out the cost of firearm in the city of San Jose uh, because the city of San Jose clearly had a disproportionate high rate of gun violence relative to its population with several crime hotspots that you saw earlier in, in Marissa McEwen's maps within its borders. And we felt like greater attention to data analysis in the city of San Jose was important. 
also, um, the city of San Jose and the County of Santa Clara Public Health Department collaborated uh, early on in this study. Um, it took us much, much longer than it took the city of San Jose uh, to do our analysis, but we wanted to uh, come back and make a few corrections. Um, the most notable finding is that per capita cost for firearm injuries were $977 in the city of San Jose, nearly double the per capita cost of $523 in the rest of the county. Overall, the total cost in firearms in the city of, say, in the city of San Jose remains the same um, from the cost uh, that were projected earlier. The differences uh, that are gonna be included in the report are just based on, we had some slight changes uh, in the cost breakdowns due to recent changes in the value per cost life uh, which is indexed by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And so we are wrapping up the final report now, which will be going to the Board of Supervisors at the August 30th board meeting. And following that, we'll be wrapping it up and we'll have a policy copy that we could uh, share more broadly. I don't think I'm gonna talk about this slide much because I think it was already represented in previous conversations, but this just highlights again, the disproportionate impact of a non-fatal firearm injury related uh, to race and ethnicity, as you can see. And then when we move to deaths, you can see the same thing, that there's a disproportionate impact um, by race. So we had an opportunity to, uh, in addition to submitting the cost analysis to the Board of Supervisors, to really conduct some, um, to provide some recommendations for consideration, since the ultimate goal was to advise on policy and programmatic decision-making. We spent some time um, conducting stakeholder interviews with the Prevention Institute so that we could really learn the pulse of the community and our uh, government uh, departments and city partners uh, perspective that will help inform and guide us in the recommendation. We had a series of stakeholder meetings that was represented by a diversity of people in the county, community-based organizations and groups and neighborhood associations, residents, gun prevention advocacy groups, cities, a variety of representat representatives from cities, including mayors, city managers, department program managers, police, um, and district office attorneys, probation office, behavioral health, office of reentry services, and office of pretrial services. We also, in our resident and community and geographic areas, we had stakeholder meetings. So we had a uh, resident and nonprofit community-based organization meeting specifically in the east side of San Jose. And we also had some in the South County in the Gilroy area so that we could really have some uh, good clean rec representation of those areas where, where we have hotspots. The highlighted recommendations uh, provide a promising path that represents strong desire amongst these stakeholders to really strengthen a coordinated violence prevention response among multiple partners. While this list is not exhaustive of all the possible actions that could be taken, you saw the, the richness of the work that the district attorney's office is doing. Um, it, there, there is much, much work that's being done. And we try to highlight some of that in our um, legislative file that's going to the Board of Supervisors on August 30th. There is a wealth and breadth of, of actions and activities and leadership that is already happening around gun violence prevention in the County of Santa Clara. But we wanted to hone in our recommendations based on themes that came up from our stakeholder meetings. Um, these, were, these recommendations require collaboration, ownership and investments from both government and non-government institutions. So the first one, is um, around strengthening policy, advocacy, and public awareness. We want to encourage the adoption of gun safety policies and practicing. Advancing a culture of gun safety would require us to establish more robust evidence-based gun safety policies and practices. The second one is to uh, 
adopt a racial equity impact assessment tools to evaluate county or city policy positions on gun advocate um, guns and advocate for more equitable prevention policies at the county, state, and federal levels. We often imagine and dream and really try to advance change through policy changes, but sometimes those policy changes have unintended consequences. We, we are recommending utilizing a racial equity impact assessment tool to make sure that we don't have unintentional harm that disproportionately impacts people that are most at risk and most vulnerable to gun violence. The third one is a is really a assortment and kind of a um, accumulation of a lot of things around public awareness and education that came up during the stakeholder meetings. And so we really want to implement a, implement a portfolio of public awareness and education campaigns on gun violence prevention. There is a lot of um, of information to broaden the understanding of safe of gun safety laws. Marissa just, Marissa just talked about uh, gun violence restraining orders and the importance of providing training so people understand it and that people can utilize it more effectively. Uh, there's other uh, policy changes around, I mean, public awareness um, recommendations around really um, focusing on gun safety uh, opportunities and also Kind of changing the paradigm of what guns actually mean in the community and, and the symbolism around gun uh, possession and gun ownership. You can go to the next slide. The fourth one is adopt and replicate a community center place-based approaches. I, Annie Wu from the Public Health Department is going to be joining the City of San Jose shortly to talk about East San Jose Peace Partnership, which is an example of that. There's much evidence on place-based strategies to gun prevention in neighborhoods facing concentrated disadvantage and our concentrations of risk. Um, I think uh, Dr. Webster talked a little bit about this. Uh, we're recommending that we really think about how we can invest more in these place-based strategies to really build community, build capacity in community levels, all aim to address protective factors that advance equity. The fifth one is to expand partnership with ethnic behavioral health services providers. We have some models currently in the county for mobile crisis care units that are very therapeutic in, in nature. Our proposal is to expand this model to really include um, community partnerships where we could have uh, licensed clinical teams sitting side by side by community resident leaders and trained community members who are experts and skilled in community-based crisis intervention, could do de-escalation, could do crisis intervention, and are known trusted members in the community that can really help uh, avoid a uh, crisis that might happen, including police-involved crisis that comes up. The sixth one is to support excluded youth by increasing partnerships between cities, school districts, and the county. Uh, there is often a, a menu and, and a list of services that youth are able to uh, take advantage of and participate in, but there are a, a population of youth that aren't actually in those some of those places. They might not be in typical school settings. They may not be at community centers. And so a focus on specific uh, activities and uh, prevention programs and recreational programs for youth that um, are at risk um, for gun violence. And then last, it's about data. Um, you heard already the importance from both the speakers before about the importance of data. Data was the mo most challenging factor in completing this study. It was very, very difficult to get data across sectors. It's very difficult to get data from the state of California. It's very difficult to get population level from community action work that's happening. So we're really recommending expanding our focus and really having a dedicated gun safety data working group who could really work at um, building a, a, a lake or a repository of data so that we can better understand gun violence. It's very complicated. It's very complex, but also so that we can really provide uh, to track the trends and measure the impact of all of our efforts collectively so that we can 
um, inform whether or not we're making a difference, whether or not we need to pivot or whether or not we need to move in a new direction. And the last slide is really just uh, some resources uh, that we had that we've used and, and we're just recommending that you can have uh, your file your, on your files. In closing, we just wanna um, emphasize that we look at gun violence um, from an upstream public health approach. At the county level, these recommendations offer <laughs> forward and really address root causes of violence, promoting resiliency and building capacity at a community level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rhonda, for that presentation. And we'll just note for the council that Rhonda mentioned a racial equity tool for use um, on gun violence issues. And you'll note that uh, attach, attachment D to the memo we issued for this study session is an example of one such tool. Peter, uh, thank yeah. you. I'm sorry to interrupt again, but uh, Rhonda mentioned she may have to go. Is there value in just seeing if there are any pressing questions now? Would that be all right? Okay, great. Rhonda, you wanted to hang out for a few more minutes here? Sure, happy to. Thank you for your presentation. Let's just go quickly to see if uh, any colleagues had questions. Um, I'm not seeing any on the Zoom. Um, Councilmember Pross? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. Uh, and thank you, Rhonda. The question I have may also be able to be answered by city staff, So, but I'd like Rhonda's maybe perspective out of it. I'm curious how well, Rhonda, you and your team at the county are working with, say, the city of San Jose or other cities in the county um, where you are you know, partnering to actually implement these recommendations that you laid out. I, I, I do appreciate that. Um, I think that from the, the presentation that we, we heard first from um, the professor mentioned the idea about that investment we have in communities specifically these communities that we see with with higher gun violence, we saw the the map from the heat map from the DA's office where you can pinpoint areas right in, in our city. Um, and I know that we are having some investments, things like Project Hope, when we use our gangs hotspot, Mayor, Mayor's Game Prevention Task Force. But I am just curious, it looks like what you presented today, Rhonda, was much more comprehensive. And I am not aware of, you know, where, how we are working together as a city with you and the county um, in those recommendations. So that, that's the, the question, if you could give your perspective before our, our city staff are able to give their. Oh, sure, uh, happy to. Um, we value our relationship with the city of San Jose very, very much. We work very, very closely with Project Hope um, and, and, um, and wanna deepen uh, that partnership relationship that we have. Um, we have been actively participating in the strategic planning process for the Mayor's Prevention Gangs Task Force. I'm not sure what the new name is going to be, but um, we have been participating in that process actively. And I believe some of these recommendations have been folded into uh, that strategic planning process, process based on community input and, and our collaborative work. Um, at, we we collaborate in a number of ways. One, I just want to say through East San Jose Peace Partnership, we continue to collaborate on the neighborhood strategies. So there are many neighborhood um, kind of unorganized or un, un, um, unofficial neighborhood associations that we've been collaborating and supporting. Um, we, we, we want to continue to do that. I think what this report, finishing kind of the data analysis and cost analysis of this report, at the same time that the city of San Jose is wrapping up the strategic planning process, it provides a very rich, reinvigorating opportunity for us to sit down at the table and think about other additional ways that we could collaborate more deeply. Um, we, we continue to, uh, um, hold our collaboration, our partnership with the city of San Jose at the highest regard. And um, I'm just looking forward to seeing what more that we could be doing together. Thank you. I don't know if somebody on the city and wanted to chime in who works with Rhonda. Hi, Andrea Flora Hi, Shelton <laughs> over here. Um, Hiding. <laughs> yeah, and I'm about to um, present my slides, which will touch on some of the um, recommendations, how we're folding them in. 
in some of our strategy. Um, so I can go through the presentation. But why don't we go to you in just a moment? Sure. We're just gonna make sure we exhaust all the questions. Thank that you. was Thank it. You. So I can yeah I can hold off for the okay. rest of their presentation. Great. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. Well, Rhonda, can I just jump in also? I know there are some nonprofits that are uh, revving up to, to get more involved in this work. Do nonprofits have ready access to all the great data that you and your team have collected to help them focus their energies and resources? Absolutely. I think whatever data that we have available, we try to make it publicly available. Our website is not the most user-friendly website for community consumption. So um, what we try to do is make ourselves available as individuals and as a department. So uh, if people want the data, you know, please reach out to either myself or any Wu who's going to be uh, presenting with Andreas Shelton, uh, Flora Shelton shortly. Um, and we'll try to get you the data uh, that you need. I also will say, um, as a follow-up to uh, this uh, final uh, report on the cost of gun violence study, we are going to be doing a little bit more of a deeper dive of mapping and analyzing uh, what are the resources and gaps that currently exist so that we can come back and, and make further recommendations for um, investment. To, to support and collaborate and to uh, leverage uh, the work that is already happening uh, by the city of San Jose staff, various nonprofit um, community-based organizations and residents. Great, thank you. And the last question I had was just, um, did you guys also rely on Ted Miller at Pyre or were you using a different uh, consultant? Yes, yeah, so we retained uh, Ted Miller from Pyre to do the economic right. the cost analysis for the for the report, and then we also uh, contracted or consulted with the Prevention Institute that helped us with the framing, uh, helped us uh, organize the stakeholder uh, meetings that we had. That's helpful. That enables us to have apples to apples comparisons with the study that we've done. So thank you very much, Rhonda. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. So thank you very much, Rhonda, for your time. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Andrea, sorry to hold you off. No problem. Um, slides. Well, I'm waiting for those. Um, Andrea Flora Shelton, I am honored to be a part of today's panel representing the Community Services Division of Parks, Recreation, Neighborhood Services. I'll be discussing our work and three specific examples that the city of San Jose invests in at the community level to prevent, address, and respond to gun violence. And I want to acknowledge that um, the pioneering work in San Jose, starting in the mid 1990s to stop violence, especially gun, gang violence, particularly among the young people. And we did this through a partnership with government, community, nonprofits, faith groups, and schools. As you know, this collective impact model um, known as the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force continues today and will be evolving. Today, I'll highlight a few key strategies that I pulled out that are related to gun violence prevention. The Community Crisis Response Protocol, Street Outreach, which is funded by Bringing Everyone's Strengths Together, or the BEST program, and the hospital-based intervention, Trauma to Triumph. And lastly, I will preview a couple of key proposals that we will be bringing forward in the upcoming MGPTF 2025 plan in November. So first, the Community Crisis Response Protocol was adopted 11 years ago. It's become a standard practice in the wake of a homicide or serious injury of a young person. We use this to prevent retaliation, ensure no further harm occurs, and ideally to restore peace. This protocol is activated in coordination with council offices and can be activated based on the age of the victim or where the incident occurs, specifically what we call the gang hotspot. After notification of the incident from San Jose Police Department to the council offices and to the Youth Intervention Services team led by Mario Maciel, and Israel Kanhura, the Youth Intervention Services team takes the lead in pulling together a team of city, county departments like the DA's office and other relevant organizations, including school leaders, nonprofit providers, and others who can give an accurate assessment of the current situation and the community climate. 
The group focuses on the victim and the family's immediate needs, discusses the environment and best ways to de-escalate the situation. At that time, a course of action is developed and each member of the group may have follow-up action items. The next phase can include a community meeting as well if there's a broader community concern that needs to be addressed. Otherwise, the action plan is carried out and the Youth Intervention Services team monitors to ensure appropriate and timely delivery of services to meet the goals. In 2021, this protocol was activated seven times, three times in Council District 7, two times in Council District 5, and one time each in Council District 3 and 1. This was related to six homicides and two firearm injuries. Our next community level approach that you're very familiar with is BEST, which stands again for bringing everyone's strengths together. BEST is one of two important violence prevention grant making investments by the city into our local nonprofit community. And it extends the city's reach with trusted partners and providers who work with youth exhibiting high risk factors in various priority schools and neighborhoods. In 2020-2021, over 2,400 youth were served by BEST providers. There are five eligible BEST services and street outreach is one of those. Street outreach contractors are expected to provide the activities you see listed on the right hand of the slide. They engage with, understand, and build relationships with youth experiencing high levels of risk factors. And they are assigned neighborhoods where there is a priority to be proactive. Currently, Two providers serve as the city's street outreach partners, New Hope for Youth and Catholic Charities. The leaders and staff from these organizations are a critical component of our overall strategy to reduce and respond to gun violence. Again, particularly among young people involved or affiliated with a gang lifestyle. Each of these organizations are also regularly involved when the community crisis response protocol is pulled together and activated. New Hope for Youth covers neighborhoods in the Foothill, Southern, and Central Police Divisions, as well as youth in Juvenile Hall. And Catholic Charities covers neighborhoods in the Western and Foothill Divisions. The next BEST cycle is scheduled to start in the new year with the release of up-to-date requests for qualifications. And I really want to thank Petra Reguero and her team for her leadership of this large and very dynamic grant program. The third strategy and uh, in addition to the best funding i want to call out is trauma to triumph this is one of the city's seven youth intervention service programs and it's again fundamental to the overall youth violence prevention strategy you saw in uh, rhonda's data that emergency room visits are very high for latinos as it relates and we count emergency room visits this is in response to um, young people who show up at two of our trauma centers in San Jose. This is a hospital-based bedside response, and thankfully, with the partnership with the County's Valley Medical Center, a pilot program was started 10 years ago. This is a, a, a joint program where we provide intentional engagement with victims ages 12 to 30. The victim's injuries can be sustained by firearm, knife, or blunt force. And unfortunately, we are seeing more participants due to gun violence. The program provides individual and family assessments and services to reduce future injury violence due to retaliation and fosters hope and support to the development of a new path for the victim. We, re we have received state funding for these programs for a few years and are very pleased that in 2020, CalVIP funded supporting the additional trauma center in East San Jose operated by Regional Medical Center. It was a rough start during COVID, but we're looking to pick up more referrals as we head into the third year. We understand that almost 200 young people would qualify um, from regional on an annual basis. And we're working to ensure that the lessons learned from the successful partnership at Valley Medical Center can be replicated at regional. I also wanted to point out that in this slide, you'll see this young man. We do have a four minute video that we didn't have time to share today, but this young man shared his story 
and he is, um, after being a victim of a, of a gunshot, is on the verge of being offered a job at Regional Medical Center. So moving from program delivery to overall strategy, um, I'm previewing a few of the objectives and key results in the upcoming MGPTF 2025 plan. After almost a year of community input and planning, I'm very excited to say that we'll, we will be rolling out an updated youth violence prevention strategy for San Jose. The next three year plan will be moving through committees and is scheduled to come to council in late November for adoption. On this slide is a high level preview of the proposed three year objectives and first year key results that are particularly related to gun violence prevention. And I think some of uh, what you saw in Rhonda's again presentation uh, related to increasing knowledge, we've heard the DA's office talking about education. Um, we are we see that as a key objective, and we see that as uh, increasing the protective factors in young people. Um, we're also very interested in continuing to reduce youth risk factors in priority neighborhoods and schools. We see that as the key objective from an intervention strategy. And then we also, along our continuum, reduce recidivism in, among young people. So those are the overall three-year objectives. And then we're pulling out some key results here as to how we would roll that out. So by December of 20, uh, 2023, we're proposing to have these results in the community related to gun violence prevention. These are not the full set of OKRs, and there will be more to come as we evolve and strengthen our 30-year collective impact model to recognize that while gang violence and crime is very real and needs an intentional approach, it's time to broaden our focus to youth violence so we can address different forms of violence when we focus on increasing protective factors and reducing risk factors and continue to make a concerted effort to leverage other change initiatives that can address the, the root causes of violence. We have the Children and Youth Master Plan, the COVID-19 Recovery Task Force, in addition to the Community Plan to End Homelessness and Reimagining Community Safety. Those are all linked to the work we would be doing to reduce and prevent youth violence. With that, uh, I can hand it over to Annie Wu. And thank you, Andrea. Um, we will now turn to Annie Wu, uh, pub <clears throat> health planning specialist from the Santa Clara County Public Health Department, who will provide an overview and highlights of the East San Jose Peace Partnership. Annie has local and international experience serving marginalized communities as a frontline service provider, researcher, community organizer, and program administrator. So I'll turn it over to Annie. Hi, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Uh, I'm Annie Wu, as introduced, and I'm here to talk about the East San Jose Peace Partnership. Next slide. So why East San Jose? So I just want to tell you a little bit about the uh, Peace Partnership. So Peace is an acronym that stands for Prevention Efforts to Advance Community Equity. Uh, it was founded in 2016 as an Accountable Community for Health, or an ACH site. It's a model as part of the California Accountable uh, Communities for Health Initiative, so the COCHI program. Uh, we are a multi-sectoral and resident-centered collaborative to address community violence and trauma in East San Jose, uh, particularly uh, using a uh, healing-based model, uh, as well as uh, focusing on resiliency and protective factors. So we are place-based. We're really focusing on efforts in, uh, in three zip codes. So 95122, 95127, and 95116 in East San Jose. I believe they are uh, in the areas of Alum Rock, Mayfair, Santee. Um, and as you can see from the slide, you know, these are areas that, has a, that have a high concentration of uh, violence, of economic disparities, of um, you know, chronic health conditions, of um, lack of housing, and various other issues that really kind of make up the bedrock of uh, conditions that lead to ultimately lead to violence. Uh, next slide. But um, at the same time, you know, we, we do want to also counter those kind of more deficit based narratives with just really highlighting that we're also working in this community because of their strength, right? Uh, there's a huge amount of community pride, a rich and diverse history of just 
uh, cultural heritages, and also um, a resident activism. Um, there are lots and lots of resident leaders, uh, lots of community assets, and lots of resilience. So this is definitely a community that has a can-do attitude and is ready to partner to, to transform themselves. Next slide. So a little bit about who makes up uh, peace. So as you can see, it's made up of a lot of grassroots organizations, uh, community-based organizations, um, some businesses. Uh, we had community clinics, uh, philanthropy uh, organizations, youth organizations, and uh, also we have strong partners from um, the city of San Jose, different agencies, especially um, the housing uh, department. Um, and um, the County of Santa Clara Public Health Department and Violence Prevention Program serves as the backbone. So the kind of providing the coordination and logistical support for this collaborative. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about our structure. Um, we, we have a um, resident-led uh, leadership team that oversees governance and decision-making. And then uh, within that, um, when we first started, we identified um, 14 kind of priorities for violence prevention. And out of those, we kind of narrowed it down to about four or five different like key priorities that really address the root causes of violence, right? We're not, uh, we really, in this collaborative, we really want to center on asking that question, why? And going deeper beyond, what, you know, looking at not just like, what are the conditions that would lead a young person or whoever to per commit violence? Um, so we really centered on, um, fighting uh, displacement and providing, creating uh, more housing, better housing, uh, supporting efforts that create better housing for, for residents, uh, centering on um, uh, combating um, intimate partner violence um, through kind of existing infrastructures and resources such as the clinic to community uh, linkage model and through uh, promotora model, those um, that already exist in the community and how to uplift that and, and align that with institutional efforts. Uh, next slide. So I'm skipping over a lot of different details, but um, I just want to really focus on some of our key successes over the years. So in 2020, uh, during the beginning of COVID, that, that was when our collaborative really came together. We really paused our uh, usual agenda and program and really kind of sat down with our resident leaders and, and had a very in-depth learning, uh, listening sessions with them. I really learned that uh, what they really need is some immediate financial relief, especially for residents who um, do not have access to other maybe existing government resources. And so we, we have a wellness fund um, that's a, a very unique kind of um, funding pool, funding mechanism that braids and blends funding from different sources to, to be able to be used for community identified uh, needs. And so we um, allocated set of money from a wellness fund and our partners worked with us to fundraise over uh, $600,000 $600, to support over 730 uh, East San Jose individuals and families and over 30 small businesses in need. And all that kind of decision-making, the funding decision-making and the distribution were uh, largely led in, uh, by the residents themselves. Next slide. And then uh, focusing specifically on the violence prevention activities, um, some of the work we've been doing is, uh, as I mentioned before, preventing intimate partner violence through upstream system change. Uh, we really centered on uh, clinic to community linkages, um, supporting this initiative called Cues or program called Cues, which is a universal education screening of uh, intimate partner violence in the clinic setting, uh, really partnering with um, or agencies like uh, Community Health Partnership and uh, Next Door Solutions, and also building capacity through the Promotora model to do outreach and education in the community around um, uh, violence prevention. Uh, we also have some sort of um, very grassroots-led organizing, or organizing and um, events around uh, community-based healing and peacemaking. So what do you do after some form of trauma or violent event has happened in the community? So we have worked with residents who hold uh, community conversations after uh, police shootings in neighborhoods. Uh, we facilitate dialogue, like organize the community to facilitate, facilitate dialogue between um, resident leaders and police, especially in the context of, of the hiring of the new police chief. And also we organize a healing-based forum in response to the, um, the rising anti-Asian violence um, back in May of last year. 
And I believe that's that's all I'll say on P, on behalf of Peace. Um, I just also thank you so much, and um, I just also want to mention that in addition to Peace at um, the Violence Prevention Program at Public Health, we also have other place-based initiatives, such as uh, Peace Safe and Peaceful Neighborhoods, which really really focused on currently is really focused on um, activation of parks of community spaces in kind of these high impact neighborhoods, um, such as Children in the Rainbow Park, which um, I was there last Friday uh, with a lot of San Jose staff. And so it was great to see everybody there. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. And our next presenter is Lieutenant Steve Donahue from the San Jose Police Department who will be providing us with an overview of gun violence orders and how they are used here in San Jose. All right, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm gonna start with what a gun violence order is. So essentially gun violence orders are court orders that prohibit guns and ammunition. They're civil orders, they're not criminal, but violations of a gun violence order is criminal. So what do they do? Well, a gun violence order prohibits individuals from possessing, owning, buying, or receiving firearms. If the individual already owns or possesses a firearm, they have to turn it into law enforcement, sell it, or store it at a firearm dealer. Unfortunately, gun violence orders do not keep people away from one another. They don't cease contact or harassment or make people move out of a residence. Typically, these are done by restraining orders or civil harassment orders. So what are the requirements? Well, in, in order to obtain a gun violence order, the subject needs to pose a significant danger in the near future of causing injury to themselves or another person by having a firearm. The order needs to be necessary for protection and less restrictive alternatives have been tried or they won't work. And if we meet all these criteria, a judge will likely approve of the request for the gun violence order. These orders can be used in cases where threats would lead us to believe the person is a danger to themselves or others. Where, based on a mental condition, the person is a danger to themselves or others, or in cases of intimate partner violence. Now, sometimes it's unnecessary to obtain a gun violence order because the subject is already prohibited from possessing or owning a firearm. For example, persons who are convicted of a felony or have a prior hospitalization for being a danger to themselves or others are automatically prohibited. And similarly, if domestic violence restraining orders or civil protective orders are in place, obtaining a gun violence order would be redundant. So police are not the only people capable of acquiring gun violence orders. The same legal criteria applies where the requester must demonstrate that the subject poses a significant danger in the near future of causing injury to themselves or others by having a firearm and the orders necessary for protection and less restrictive alternatives were tried or won't work. However, in those cases, gun violence orders may be obtained by coworkers, employers, household members, family members, and teachers or faculty at a school. There are three different types of gun violence orders. The first one we're gonna talk about is the Gun Violence Emergency Protective Order, which we call a GVEPO. The Ex Parte Gun Violence Restraining Order, which we call the Ex Parte GVRO or Ex Parte Order, and the Order After Hearing. We're gonna start with GVEPOs. Now these are used, um, or I'm sorry, these are issued by law enforcement in the field at a call for service. They give the officer the ability to take the guns away from the subject right away, and they last for 21 days. The next one is the ex parte order. These are filed by attorneys like the city attorney or any of the people I talked about earlier, like family members, coworkers, et cetera. And these are temporary orders. They last 21 days until the time a hearing in front of a judge can be scheduled. These are delayed, meaning they're filed with the court after the fact and not in the presence of the person who's being restrained. So there's nobody taking the guns from that person at that particular time. And that's gonna be key as we go on here. And the final type is the order after hearing. And these are issued by a judge after a hearing in court. They last anywhere from one to five years. And again, these are delayed, 
And so there's nobody taking guns from the subject at that time either. Now, both the ex parte order and the order after hearing create officer safety concerns for service because we know the subject is armed. They've proven to be a danger to themselves or others, which is a criteria for issuance of these. And now we're creating a confrontation where we're taking their guns. So these post hoc services can be very dangerous. For our agency, San Jose PD, the typical process is that the officer in the field at a call for service requests and receives the GVEPO. Now the officer then takes the subject's firearm right then and there. Then one of our other sergeants, Sergeant Numer, who works with the city attorney's office, files an ex parte order with the court. During the period before the hearing, before the, I'm sorry, before the hearing before the judge, the city attorney's office drafts affidavits that are used to articulate the need to keep the firearms out of the subject's hands. And then there's a hearing before the judge and an order after hearing is issued. So I'd like to give some kudos to Sergeant Numer and the city attorney's office. Every order that has been requested so far has been granted. And they've requested an order on every single case in which one could be issued because the person wasn't otherwise prohibited. As a matter of fact, last fiscal year, we filed 66 GVEPOs, which was the most in all of Northern California. And nearly all of those resulted in orders after a hearing. And as you can see, we've been increasing our GVOs filed every year since we started. So what can we do to increase the number of gun violence orders filed every year? Well, the first thing, like you've heard from many of our other presenters, is public education. People need to know that these are out there and how to acquire them. We do this using our community partners, our social media, and directing people to speakforsafety.org, which is a campaign to raise awareness about GVROs and provide resources and tools to obtain them. We need to make sure our officers are trained in when to request them, how to request them, and what to do when we come across them. So we've done this through several training bulletins, in-person trainings at briefings, and directing officers to request them on departmental forms. In addition, these have been added to our report receipts for survivors of intimate partner violence, so they can know that these are available when they receive those forms. We need to continue our collaboration with the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office. And when, uh, unfortunately, uh, Marissa beat me to this. I was totally gonna give her kudos because we have a great relationship with them, but um, I'm still gonna say it. So I'd like to thank uh, the DA's office for our relationship, especially with the GRIP team. They do an outstanding job and Marissa taught me everything I know about the subject. I just want everybody to know that. Okay. And finally, <laughs> we need to continue our directed personnel tasking with Sergeant Numer at the city attorney's office and they do an outstanding job on the back end getting these orders across the line with the order after hearing. So ultimately though, it boils down to two things, which is gonna be communication and proactive engagement. And if we obtain the GV EPOs in the field, whenever the situation dictates, we're gonna be more successful at recovering firearms and protecting the public. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lieutenant. Uh, we're now gonna turn our attention to the last portion of today's study session, legal context and current policy efforts. Our first presenter is Dr. Shannon Frateroli, professor at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, whose research interests include understanding the role of policy in improving health in populations. She's involved with research and practice efforts to implement firearm dispossession provisions of domestic violence restraining orders, and the new extreme risk protection orders in several states across the country. Dr. Yes, thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm pleased to be here to talk with you about some of the work that I've been doing with colleagues around the country on gun violence restraining order laws. I actually don't have any slides with me today. I thought that uh, you all were in a lengthy afternoon session, so I thought it might be nice to just take a bit of a break from slides and we can just have a brief conversation for the next uh, 15 minutes. 
Um, so as was stated, I've, I've been working around uh, gun violence restraining order law implementation and evaluation, providing technical assistance to states and jurisdictions around the country now for, uh, for a number of years. And when I look at the data and look at what's happening um, with regard to uptake of GVROs, um, what I see is a great deal of variation, both uh, within states, across those jurisdictions within states, as well as across states. And what that signals to me um, is uh, the need for attention to implementation and enforcement of these gun violence restraining order laws. Uh, even though California um, has had its law in place now for a number of years, I want to acknowledge that this is a different way of doing business um, for law enforcement agencies and communities around gun violence prevention. So it's important to assure that the infrastructure and the support for implementation is happening. And I was really pleased to learn about the efforts underway um, from Lieutenant Donahue um, and, and the, the work to assure that there are people in place who know how to use those laws and that they are being used when the situation calls for. Um, but I do have some additional suggestions that might be helpful for you in San Jose to increase the good work that's going on and really maximize the benefits that, um, are, that gun violence restraining orders um, have that is possible with this kind of policy intervention. So while I'm here to talk about domestic or gun violence restraining orders, I want to sort of um, switch gears a little bit and talk about domestic violence restraining orders because these are the policies on which gun violence restraining orders are built. And as a country, as um, the state of California and the city of San Jose, we have a lot more experience and a lot more knowledge about domestic violence restraining orders and how they can be used, again, a civil order process to temporarily restrict people who are behaving dangerously and at risk of violence um, toward their intimate partners from purchasing and possessing guns. So there's good lessons there from the longer timeline that we have from domestic violence restraining orders that I'd like to just highlight for, for a minute here before turning back to uh, gun violence restraining orders. So about um, 10, 15 years ago, I was involved in a, in a study with my colleagues at the University of California, Davis, uh, to look at uh, implementation of domestic violence restraining orders with regard to that gun dispossession provision in uh, San Mateo and um, Butte County. So, you know, some jurisdictions that are, that are neighbors to San Jose. And again, uh, you know, the realization was that even though domestic violence restraining orders have been on the books for a number of years, and even though the provisions that allowed for dispossession, temporary dispossession of firearms and um, restrictions on the purchase of new firearms, what we knew was that those laws weren't essentially being used. They weren't essentially being implemented. So we set out to work with those two jurisdictions, San uh, Mateo and uh, Butte County, to figure out the systems and processes that were needed in order to realize um, a fuller embrace of those prohibitions on um, firearm possession and purchase when there was a risk, domestic violence restraining order in place. And, and what we found uh, was the need for the kinds of systems that Lieutenant Donahue outlined. Um, the need for uh, specialized, specially trained law enforcement, uh, people who have knowledge of these laws, who have the skills uh, to know when to use these laws, and who are ready to respond when their fellow officers or partners in the prosecutor's office or partners in the advocacy field um, are alerting them that there's someone who is violent toward a partner, um, guns are an issue, and um, what kind of tools do we have to get those guns out of the hands of people who are being violent toward their loved ones? So the kind of system that resulted from that intervention, again, shared many of the same characteristics that we heard from Lieutenant Donahue. Um, so again, 
specially trained um, officers from the sheriff's office, uh, detectives from the sheriff's office, or office who were um, sort of designated as domestic violence restraining order officers. They were there to serve those petitions to assure that gun dispossession happened in accordance with the orders issued by the judge. Um, we saw the importance of making sure that there was a process in place to figure out how that dispossession could happen in a way that was safe for all involved. Uh, you know, because as, as, Lieutenant, as the Lieutenant mentioned, when you're talking about serving an order on a person who is identified as being violent, uh, and you're talking with them about um, wanting to remove um, guns in their possession and temporarily prohibit their ability to purchase new guns, um, that's a potentially volatile situation. And so through that process, we did identify with, again, the sheriff's offices in Butte and San Mateo County, strategies for doing that work successfully. And again, I think there are lessons in that work, in the experience with domestic violence restraining orders that can inform your work moving forward with gun violence restraining orders. Because again, in a lot of ways, they're very similar processes. Civil court process, involved that are invoked in response to people who are behaving dangerously um, and the desire to temporarily restrict uh, the purchase and possession of guns. So I would encourage the council to look toward that work, look toward the lessons of uh, San Mateo and Butte County with regard to domestic violence uh, restraining orders. And then I would also say, sort of moving back to gun violence restraining orders, um, when I look around the country, one of the models for the best practices, again, in my, from my perspective, in terms of implementation of gun violence restraining orders, um, one of the jurisdictions that, that, that's at the top of my list is King County, Washington. And what King County, Washington has done is something that I think that you and San Jose are very well positioned to do, which is they have established sort of a specialized team that focuses on gun dispossession through civil orders that includes domestic violence restraining orders, that includes orders to address um, people who are um, stalking others, and that includes their gun violence restraining orders. So what they have in King County, Washington is a team with representatives from the court, from the prosecutor's office, from uh, Seattle PD, from the sheriff's office, and from advocates who work with family members, who work with people who are experiencing crisis. These people all work together. They examine sort of the cases that come before them. They assess when, um, you know, in order to dispossess um, a person from firearms, a civil order is in line, and they work together to make that process happen smoothly and effectively and assure that that gun dispossession happens. Uh, and, and again, um, some of the sort of um, maybe uh, challenges that the Lieutenant highlighted was, you know, gun violence restraining orders are appropriate for certain kinds of cases, but there are other types of civil orders, domestic violence restraining orders that are more appropriate in cases of partner violence. So if you have a team that is sort of trained and knowledgeable and sort of the go-to people for all of these types of civil protection orders, then what you have and what we're seeing in King County, Washington, is a team of people who can really respond to the dangerous situations with the type of civil order that is appropriate for that, for that situation, and a team of people who can figure out how to best and most safely assure that any guns that are in the possession of the respondent to whatever order is deemed to be most appropriate for that situation, um, is used and those guns are removed in a way that is, is safe for all involved. Um, so again, I would say that um, there's good lessons to be learned from the work that we've done previously in, um, in San Mateo and in Butte County around domestic violence restraining orders. And there's good lessons to be learned associated with 
per being able to purchase and possess guns when people are behaving dangerously and at risk of violence. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, uh, you know, happy to um, answer any questions or provide any information, but though that about covers my remarks that I wanted to share with you today. And again, thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Really appreciate your time. Um, we're going to move to our last speaker and then we'll be able to flip back to Q&A. Our last speaker is Professor Adam Winkler. He is the Connell Professor of Law at UCLA. Professor Winkler is a specialist in American constitutional law, the Supreme Court, and gun policy. His scholarship has been cited in landmark Supreme Court cases on the First and Second Amendment and is one of the 20 most cited law professors in judicial opinions today. Uh, he'll be focusing uh, today on concealed carry permits. Professor Winkler, are you available? I am. Can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, thank you. We can, you. thank you. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, this is, of course, a challenging time for lawmakers and uh, gun safety reform advocates. Um, the Supreme Court has um, really upended uh, concealed carry policies in California and a number of other states. Um, with the Bruin decision in June, which struck down a provision of New York's concealed carry permitting policy uh, that required uh, the applicant to show that they had proper cause to carry a firearm. Uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to put up a couple slides just to give you a sense of where I'm going and what I'm doing. Uh, boom. Okay, um, so uh, the the Bruin case um, uh, was I important because it really uh, puts places like San Jose uh, at the burden of uh, revising concealed carry policies uh, in a way that um, corresponds with the current court's view of the Second Amendment. Bruin does not mean that cities uh, are prohibited from regulating concealed carry but it does make it somewhat more difficult, and it certainly does make it pretty certain that almost no matter what you do, litigation is going to follow. Uh, and um, uh, Bruin is not the end or final word on concealed carry policies. Um, I think the better way to understand it is it's the beginning of um, um, I imagine a, a little bit of uh, disputation and uh, efforts to regulate concealed carry that will go to before the Supreme Court and the higher courts uh, over the next, uh, you know, five, seven, ten years. Uh, we probably are going to see a lot of litigation follow. And uh, the truth is, Bruin did not provide terrific clarity um, and raises as many questions uh, as it answers. Um, like I said, the New York's, uh, New York's proper cause permitting requirement was struck down, uh, but the court, in its majority opinion, also provided that other kinds of permitting requirements are allowed, that you can still require a license uh, or a permit, uh, and that uh, you can have uh, things like objective criteria to ensure someone's a law-abiding, responsible citizen, and guns can be restricted in sensitive places. I've also uh, put on the slide here and want to make note of uh, the concurring opinion in the Bruin case filed by Justices Kavanaugh and uh, Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts. Um, I think this is an important concurrence because it doesn't really do much except provide clarity that two of the justices in the six member majority believe that there that government does have a broad range of discretion in how it uh, creates eligibility requirements for uh, concealed carry. Uh, and it matters because uh, it's possible, not clear exactly how much, but at least it's possible that there's some daylight between the Kavanaugh and Roberts position and the Thomas position set forth in the majority opinion. Uh, and of course, um, uh, uh, for uh, supporters of gun safety reform, uh, they might be very interested in exploiting that difference because uh, Kavanaugh and Roberts might well join with the three more liberal members of the Supreme Court who dissented in Bruin to uphold various kinds of requirements. And Kavanaugh's uh, concurrence uh, identified that the central problem with New York's concealed carry policy was that it provided what he called open-ended discretion to government officials 
to um, determine who gets a license and who does not. And that suggests that it's very important that whatever kind of permitting process you have, you do so in a way that's designed to reduce the open-endedness. That is to say, uh, it's important to provide detailed guidance for uh, the issuance of these permits. And the more detail that you can provide, the more clarity in the, in the uh, eligibility requirements, the more likely it is to uh, satisfy justices uh, Kavanaugh and Roberts and, uh, and likely a majority of the Supreme Court. Um, uh, Kavanaugh uh, specifically uh, pointed out that uh, the kinds of objective criteria used in the 43 states that currently have shall issue uh, permitting policies uh, are the kinds of things that uh, are constitutionally permissible. Um, uh, and that the objective criteria can be used to ensure that someone is a law-abiding, responsible citizen. And I think that language is important, um, that um, by ensuring that someone's a law-abiding, responsible citizen is more than just saying someone is not a prohibited purchaser. It gives the government leeway to look beyond whether someone's just strictly speaking a prohibited purchaser who obviously shouldn't be able to get a concealed carry license to require uh, more um, uh, to require more in the form of eligibility to get uh, a concealed carry uh, permit. So I want to talk a little bit about objective uh, eligibility criteria and then a little bit about sensitive places. With regards to objective criteria, right, there are common forms of objective criteria, right? So for instance, one doesn't have a felony conviction or one does uh, a modicum of training uh, at uh, an appropriate institution um, uh, that has uh, been blessed or licensed, and licensed by the state to provide firearms training. Um, uh, but I think that it's important to recognize that uh, California does have and uh, lawmakers are free to adopt other kinds of suitability requirements too. While you couldn't phrase them as good cause to carry a weapon, um, and while we couldn't have requirements that focus on the reason someone wants to carry a weapon, there is still much that can be done with regards to the suitability of the particular applicant to carry a weapon. So um, uh, uh, we have, for instance, in 21 of the states that currently have shall issue permitting, even if you are otherwise law abiding, that is to say you're not a prohibited purchaser, you haven't, haven't had no felony convictions, you can still be denied a permit if you're deemed not to have the appropriate character or temperament to carry a firearm. Um, again, Kavanaugh and Roberts said that those 43 states, uh, what they do is constitutionally permissible. The fact that 21 of those states um, have a character or temperament requirement um, is indicative that it's likely to be constitutionally permissible. Um, so what kinds of things can uh, cities or states do to ensure that someone has the appropriate character or temperament? Well, I think in practice, it means that cities and states can do detailed background investigations into applicants looking at, for instance, their arrest records, their, whether they've been subject to a restraining order, uh, whether there is a significant mental health history that uh, leads one to be concerned about someone being a danger to themselves or to others in the community. Um, uh, again, there, the fact that you might have been arrested in the past would not make you a prohibited purchaser. Um, but it might be something that speaks to the character and test uh, uh, character and temperament of the underlying applicant. Um, cities and states can require testimonials from people to say that the applicant has good moral character. Um, uh, and note that with regards to objective criteria such as training or education requirements, these can be a lot tougher than they are today for concealed carry licenses. In the state of California, for instance, if you want to uh, get a, a license to be a hairdresser, well, you do like something like 1,600 hours uh, at state uh, recognized or licensed facilities. <laughs> if you want to be, uh, and that's to be able to put dangerous chemicals on someone's hair. Uh, if you want to be a pesticide applicator, again, a dangerous activity that we have objective criteria for. You have to go through extensive educational and training requirements 
far more burdensome than we require for someone to carry a firearm. So I think even with regards to just training and education requirements, these requirements can be made pretty tough and uh, can, we can add significant hours to that uh, activity, especially in light of the fact that uh, the number of people who are harmed, uh, significantly harmed by hairdressers or pesticide applicators is probably going to be uh, uh, somewhat low in comparison to those who are harmed by gun violence. Um, now, just to say that you can make them tougher is not to say that I recommend the, to the San Jose City Council that you make it 1,600 hours of training before one can carry a concealed firearm. Um, I think that anything you do will be questioned in court and, and something that's significantly out of line with um, uh, other kinds of objective criteria and perhaps even objective criteria in other states for concealed carry um, uh, will be challenged and could be overturned. Whether there's enough votes on the Supreme Court or the Ninth Circuit to overturn um, tougher education and training requirements, we just don't know. We'll have to see that. Uh, Justice Thomas very specifically called out in his Bruin opinion that uh, even objective criteria can be abused and lengthy wait times and exorbitant fees are the kinds of things that courts will second guess. A final point is that you can have with regards to objective criteria as part of that you can have a short licensing period. Um, uh, I think we, we will see in the coming years is that some cities and states will try to make it somewhat more difficult to maintain a permit if you get one by requiring that you get a new permit every six months or every uh, every year. Um, uh, again, we don't know exactly how the courts are going to rule on that, and there will be challenges, uh, but that's at least a space where we might see some experimentation. And then finally, just on sensitive places, uh, the courts have been clear, and the Supreme Court's been clear, that you can prohibit guns from sensitive places. Uh, the Heller case said that uh, schools and government buildings are presumptively areas where you cannot carry firearms. Uh, Bruin uh, itself pointed to 19th century sensitive places legislation that barred guns from legislative assemblies, polling places, and courthouses as being fully consistent with the Second Amendment. But the Bruin court also went further and said that lawmakers can draw analogies from those sensitive places to identify and protect new sensitive places. So um, uh, uh, you're not limited to only those sense of things that were deemed sensitive places in the 19th century. The question becomes, what makes a place a sensitive place? And uh, truth be told, we don't have any real clarity on that. The court said you can draw an analogy to some of those other places, but didn't tell us what would be the basis of a good analogy. Legislative assemblies, polling places, and courthouses are all government buildings in some way, shape, or form, or serving government functions. Is that a requirement? I don't think so, but again, we're not sure exactly which variables are, are uh, matter. Um, one thing does seem clear, that if we include schools and government buildings, along with polling places and legislative assemblies, um, uh, then it would seem that it is not a requirement that the government provide comprehensive security for those people who enter that premise, that, those premises. While it's true that today courthouses have uh, extensive security and you're not getting into any significant uh, federal or state courthouse probably without going through a metal detector and making sure no one has guns, that's not traditionally how courthouses were. And certainly in the 19th century when the court says those sensitive places legislation were permissible, um, legislative assemblies, polling places and courthouses generally did not provide security. And certainly today, not all schools and not all government buildings ha have security. Uh, if you go down to my local government building to get a zoning, uh, uh, I mean, to get a permit for my uh, building, con a construction permit for my home, uh, it's very likely that building will not have extensive security or kind of the kind of comprehensive security we might expect at some place like uh, the Supreme Court. Uh, so what are some of the options that uh, cities and states have before them? Well, they could regulate, for instance, uh, pro prohibit guns from sens sensitive places like hospitals or healthcare facilities, public transportation, public parks and athletic facilities, libraries, churches, museums, and amusement parks. And importantly, with regards to all of these areas, there may well be constitutionally permissible to say that there's a zone around those places in which one cannot possess a firearm. As many of you know, there's a federal gun-free school zones act that says you can't take a firearm uh, 
with some exceptions, but you can't take a firearm within a certain number of feet of a, of a school. Um, uh, presumably, we could have church zones, museum zones, uh, amusement park zones, library zones, as well as school zones. Exactly how big? Again, we do not know, but presumably there's some space around the, those uh, kinds of um, uh, locations in which guns can be uh, restricted. Another important element of any sensitive places restriction might well be to reverse the presumption with regards to private property. Um, in many states that allow concealed carry, the presumption is, is that you can carry your firearm on private property, um, most likely, uh, I'm sorry, speaking specifically of privately owned commercial property that's open to the public, um, that uh, the general presumption is, is that you're entitled to possess a firearm when you go onto privately owned commercial property that's open to the public, uh, unless there's a sign that says no guns allowed. And if you go to Nashville today, um, uh, you'll, you'd almost be tempted to think it's less gun friendly than California because you have all these stores that say no guns allowed, don't, no, you're not allowed to carry your firearm in this, uh, in, in this store. We don't have a lot of that in Los Angeles uh, or San Jose or other cities in, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, one thing we can do, though, uh, through law is to reverse the presumption, is to say instead of the presumption being you have a right to carry your firearm on, on privately owned commercial property, it could be reversed to say that there's a presumption that you cannot carry your firearm unless the, the property owner posts a sign allowing you to have uh, firearms on that property. And that makes it much difficult for concealed carry permit uh, holders because uh, if a private property, uh, private property owner does not put out a sign, then you cannot bring that gun onto that property. So these are uh, among uh, the many things that are uh, uh, on the table for uh, lawmakers uh, to do. Uh, some of this stuff may be subject to preemption in light of the fact that uh, the California State uh, Assembly is considering new legislation in this space that will cover a variety of these kinds of options. Uh, we'll have to see what ultimately gets passed, uh, but I think uh, one way to understand it is that no matter what you do, there's going to be litigation, but the Supreme Court has certainly created space for experimentation and for new restrictions on concealed carry that at least make it less likely that there's going to be a lot of guns easily carried on uh, San Jose city streets. Uh, and uh, with that, I will uh, stop my screen share. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Professor. Peter? Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Winkler. We appreciate your presentation. And that um, ends the presentation portion of this meeting today. We'd like to thank all of our presenters who partnered with us to put on this meeting including Dr. Webster for sharing his deep knowledge of research on preventative approaches, James Given Shapiro and Marissa McEwen from the DA's office, and Rhonda McClinton-Brown uh, from the Public Health Department for help us, helping us set the context for gun violence in Santa Clara County, sharing their work, and most especially for their ongoing commitment to partnering with the city on this important work. Uh, Andrea Flores Shelton from the Parks Department, Annie Wu from the Public Health Department, and Lieutenant Steve Donahue from our police department for sharing programmatic approaches. And finally, to Dr. Frateroli for her expertise on gun violence restraining orders and Dr. Winkler for his expertise on a recent de uh, legal decisions related to concealed carry. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll end our presentation, but we are available for questions. Great, thank you. And I hope those who presented uh, are able to hang on for a few minutes while we ask questions, uh, really uh, a rich, uh, amount of information. I've certainly learned a lot here, but I know we've got questions. So, uh, Council Member Perales. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and, and uh, recognize we had about 30 minutes on our calendar here. Um, so, I just want to say thank you to, to all the presenters as well, to our city staff uh, for putting this together. It's been uh, some time coming. I know it was a lot to organize, and in the, in, in the, I think the breadth of the knowledge and the presentations today uh, goes to show um, why something like this um, has taken a little bit of time to put together. I first wanted to have this conversation uh, on a more comprehensive approach for reducing gun violence um, following the, the, as we know, the, the significant uh, and impactful shooting at the PTA rail yard, which hit close to home as I lost a close friend. Prior to that, though, uh, the, the mayor had led the charge. I'd worked with him for years on how we could reduce gun violence and, and different policies here at the local level. We know we've seen it 
uh, you saw in the hot spots, and I know that I've, I've had a number of gang hot spots in just within my district that I represent here within the city of San Jose. So it's been an ongoing issue, and I've had the the pleasure of sitting on the Marriage Gang Prevention Task Force as well uh, now for the for the eighth year. And so it, it is nothing new, but what I felt we hadn't had was a really comprehensive um, understanding of everything that's happening and then what the poss possibilities may be. Um, we have, I think, attempted in our uh, own uh, city here to be able to, to look at what can we do knowing that at a federal level, as we saw in the presentations and certainly right with decisions coming down from the Supreme Court, uh, we are not seeing the level of responsiveness that, that I think our, our country as polled would support, uh, unfortunately. Um, even at the state, what I've learned today, right, is there's a lot of opportunities that, right, that I think that we may not be taking full advantage of. And so my first question is, is what, you know, as we look at what we can do here locally, um, we've, we've been, you know, criticized most recently from our approach on uh, trying to implement um, an insurance requirement as well as having a, uh, a fee that would then go to help fund a nonprofit that could, could actually do some work specifically focused on reducing gun violence. And, um, and, and so I think I am interested on where we can separate the, our advocacy to local ordinances or local policies local investment even, I think there's some very basic things from the very first uh, presentation uh, this morning from the professor that, that talked about just greening spaces, right? I mean, how kind of simple it sounds, but the reality is, is that in some of these areas that we know we have high levels of gun violence, um, we can make an investment in something as simple as, as cleaning up certain spaces that has nothing to do with, you know, our police department, or the DA's office, right? It, it could be at a much more basic city service level. Um, all the way up to what we've just talked about right now and, and, and maybe advocacy that would need to be done at the state. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of curious and want to see too, maybe some from city staff that they've learned through your understanding of this presentation and, and the work that's gone into it. Where can we have some focus here locally versus where can we kind of lobby? Where, where do we need to lobby at the state level and um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to the city manager's staff. So I, I don't know if uh, you know either of you wanted to be able to respond to that from what you've learned. Uh, thank you, council member, for the question. Um, we've certainly learned a lot from all of our presenters as well. I think that there is some work that our intergovernmental relations team uh, will be tracking, um, both the legislation that's um, currently going through the state um, but we'll have discussions around what else we could add to the legislative program in the fall that we would be bringing to you um, at the end of November, early December. Uh, we'll certainly be working with the city attorney's office on the concealed carry permits and the police department um, and other partners to understand um, what sort of changes we need to make locally. Um, and then, of course, as it relates to uh, all of the work that the DA's office has presented and other city departments, um, I think we have to just continue the conversation. I see this as a starting point. We learned a lot about blight. Um, we learned a lot about place-based initiatives. And we probably just need to continue the conversation to see what else we can do. OK, thank you. Yeah, I, I think uh, another component that I'd like to see locally within the city would be kind of translating some of this work that may right now have a narrow focus, say, within the Mayor's Game Prevention Task Force, uh, Andrea, right, your team, your presentation, and how do we translate that to the rest of the city departments, right, and, and, and have an understanding as we're making investments in, you know, DOT or Parks and Rec, right, and other places where um, it, it, it will have some other benefits outside of, right, what that what may be the wheelhouse of that department. Uh, we've started to do this through our equity work, right? That we've really rolled out now over the last year and a half. And I'd like to see um, some of this be folded into decisions made throughout the city and, and then factor into you know, how those decisions do get made. Um, and again, we've, we've talked about that on how we are now trying to have more of an equity lens as we are evaluating where we're investing in 
our resources, limited resources. Um, and so happy to hear your yeah, response. Thank you, council member. And um, you really are kind of teeing up sort of a, a work plan item that um, we've been discussing. Um, how do we bring the project hope um, survey results as well as um, well to the neighborhood CSA. So we've been talking to um, Deputy City Manager Angel Rios for um, for a few months about we're hearing from our neighborhoods, we're hearing from these leaders, and then how do we connect sort of the built, the built environment pieces that the city, other departments um, do hold and own, and how do we bring that into sort of their work plans in that context? So um, we're definitely looking to sort of connect the dots. Um, as to how, if we're investing in Project Hope as our priority neighborhoods, how do we do that across the organization? Yeah, thank you. And and lastly, and this component stood out, and I've, I've known of these statistics, but it was just, it stood out again today and likely for everybody that saw the presentation on how high and prevalent it is on uh, gun violence with when you tie it to suicide. Um, and, and that wasn't, a, a, I think, a, a a broad portion of, of any of the presentations today, right? There's a lot of focus on um, the gun violence restraining orders, right? Or domestic violence. Um, and and I think in, in things like, you know, our, our um, concealed carry and a lot around the sort of the firearm itself, right? And how do you remove that that firearm or the illegal firearms and, but not as much of a, a focus and I think a, uh, on, on that issue of, of suicide and suicide prevention and how um, how different that work really is, right? Um, you, you, when you bring the firearm into that situation, somebody that is suicidal, um, certainly we see where these, these numbers are at. Uh, but it is a whole other area of public health, right? Uh, um, uh, where it has its own needs and, and, and focus and medical experts. And uh, that's also been a, a key area of, of interest for me and seeing where we can be better uh, to to provide services, you know, starting internally with our own workforce, right, with that mental health care and support, our our, um, our public spaces, right, and how we are thinking of those, how we're offering resources. Um, think back to Martin Luther King Jr. Library, and we had a number of suicides that happened there. Um, places like that that unfortunately would become uh, attractive and, and a repetitive location. Um, and we looked at how do we, you know, Infrastructure one, and we did, we, we put up some barriers, but more importantly beyond that, it was how do we offer it? We know that now there's people coming in here and, and a, a good number of them that were experiencing homelessness. How do we offer some support? And we created a program there where we were bringing in uh, PATH, uh, our, our local contractor working in the downtown area, working with those uh, that are homeless, and they partnered with San Jose State and students to, uh, to be able to work with two days a week in MLK on a drop-in basis. This started before the pandemic, and, and so obviously uh, been a bit hindered through the last couple of years, but in offering a drop-in availability of service to those that may be experiencing mental health crises that you know potentially could now prevent that incident from, from occurring. Much more difficult area of public health, but I just, uh, you know, looking at the statistics, this is one again that I knew, and I think it's, uh, uh, it, it's really, um, its own area of need and focus that we have. I know we don't have the nonprofit that um, you know that we would like to see started up here to do some of this gun violence prevention work. Uh, and the mayor knows that that's a key focus for me. And hopefully, as that nonprofit can get lifted up, right, it it, it will be able to identify where we can can invest more of these resources. Um, you know that that hopefully we'll be able to generate and and then put them into the the places where we'll see the most positive effect. So I uh, thank you again for, for the presentation of the work. Um, one parting uh, question for the chief. I know that traditionally the, the chief of police here has not issued many um, concealed weapon permits. I know traditionally it was through the sheriff's office. Is that something that is going to have to change now? But or, or, or how are you going to be responding to that on, on concealed carry permits? Sure, thank you, council member. Um, just that's something that uh, we're looking at uh, together with uh, the city attorney's office. Uh, because the new um, a Braun decision uh, allows for either the sheriff's office or a local mm -hmm. department to uh, issue concealed carry um, permits. Uh, what I have to say is that uh, there's a few um, concealed carry uh, permits that have been issued uh, since I believe uh, 
uh, 1990s and the last one in uh, 2013, uh, but it's, it's a handful. Uh, and our policy is comprehensive in that uh, they require training, uh, background check, uh, psychological testing, and obviously with this decision, we have to take a look at the uh, good cause components of that. And that's why we're working closely with the city attorney's office to see how that policy will look like in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I was hoping I could jump on where you just left off. I think that's a super important area. Um, and I think uh, Professor Winkler gave us some great ideas about how we can conceal, constrain concealed carry. Uh, I think a lot of folks uh, understandably had fears after Bruin that we would now see millions of guns carried on our streets in, in the state. Um, and I guess the one challenge, of course, is <laughs> We could try to do everything right, but we could get preempted by the state. And I know there's a bill right now by Senator Portatino, I think it's SB 918. I understand that's being batted around now. And I'm, I'm just hoping, I, I just took a look at the textual language. I didn't see anything that obviously preempted us. There was some language that said that it won't preempt us on local requirements on vehicle um, uh, uh, possession, uh, but I'm hoping we can get engaged somehow or another with other partners in the city to ensure, in other cities, to ensure that local communities still have the authority to impose greater constraints, assuming they're objective and they're constitutional. Is, is that something that's within our, our workload, Sarah? Thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, absolutely. We've been watching this very closely. And even as of this afternoon, there were new amendments uh, that were sent our way. Um, Zane is is here in the audience, and I know that he's been tracking this uh, for the city. But we will we we can absolutely continue. Okay, advocate. that's great, Zane. I, I that was really where I was going. If you want to add something, feel free. But I really just want to know we could engage on this. Sure. Yeah, we received amendments this morning. There's 185 amendments to this legislation. Okay. Um, we were just received the amendments this morning. And so staff is now working through the amendments. Okay. Well, that mean it, it probably means it's not getting anywhere. Uh, so <laughs> that's a lot of amendments. All right. Thanks, you guys. Um, and 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 for Professor Winkler again, I really appreciate the the ideas uh, because I think many of us were concerned that all was lost after Bruin. Um, I, I just had a question about given what the the Supreme Court says in Bruin and its seeming obsession with the historic. Um, <clears throat> landscape, the legal landscape at the time the Second Amendment and the, and the 14th Amendments were being um, approved, you know, is there room for a local jurisdiction or a state to say, hey, there's lots of historic precedent with these uniform militia acts back in the 1790s, I'm sure you're aware of, that required militia members to supply their own mucket, muskets and, and every able-bodied man had to go buy a gun, or it may, it may have been racially restrictive, but one way or another, they required uh, men to actually get guns. And I think in 1795, they even modified it to say that the president would then have the authority to identify those people and call them up to the militia. And of course, everyone was concerned at the time about invasion from Britain. Uh, and so the real point of all this business about Second Amendment really was about militias and defending the country from a foreign power. And I guess the question would be, and I know the Supreme Court's taken a different view generally about the purpose of the Second Amendment, but could we at least look at the militia acts and say, hey, anybody who wants a concealed carry permit has to join the state militia, the National Guard. Is that is that viable? Well, you know, first of all, it's not clear whether it's viable or not. Uh, it does seem like uh, uh, there are some historical precedents for um, uh, for such a policy. Although I know of no state that's ever restricted concealed carry permits to those who are members of uh, the the uh, organized militia. Um, so I think there could be, you know, possibly there's it's a space for thinking creatively about how you might try to restrict. Uh, access to the concealed carry permits. But I do think that the court uh, most likely would look askance at it. The court did say in the Bruin case that the right to bear arms is the right to carry firearms in case of confrontation, um, not simply in the context of militia service. Uh, so that would sort of 
certainly weigh against uh, a militia-based uh, requirement. I also want to encourage lawmakers not to be too focused on the historical antecedents for your concealed carry policy. Uh, even though the court's Bruin decision is very much about you know, lawmakers have to pay attention to historical patterns and have to stick to historical patterns, the court kind of departs from that argument when it comes to concealed carry permitting, right? Uh, there was no shall issue permitting. With, the court blesses shall issue permitting, but there was no shall issue permitting back in uh, uh, the mid 1800s or even late 1800s. Uh, that's a 20th century invention requiring objective criteria for things like training and mental health history and whatnot. Again, all modern day requirements that don't have any basis in history and tradition. I think the way courts are going to approach these concealed carry restrictions going forward is not to, number one, ask whether they're historical antecedents, although I think the courts will do that for a lot of different kinds of gun laws. But I think with regards to concealed carry permitting requirements, I think the courts are going to look to that language in the Bruin case, both Thomas's opinion and Kavanaugh's opinion, uh, and use that as the basis for determining whether a concealed carry policy is constitutionally permissible or not. Um, and, and those don't really turn on uh, a significant engagement with history or showing a pattern of historical regulation that one is following now today. All right, thank you. Um, I, I see that uh, Councilmember Rance has her hand raised. So let me uh, just ask one last question and we'll go back to other members of the council. Um, Dr. Federoli, I think, raised, um, described in great detail the King County model. Um, and uh, I, I look at the model we've got and all the great work that's being done between the district attorney's office and uh, the police department, the city attorney, and others around, um, around what we can do within a lot of constraints on gun dispossession and, and GVROs and others. I'm just trying to understand what's the difference between what King County has and what we have. If either Dr. Fowler really wants to observe or offer her thoughts or, or if any of our team wants to, what are we missing? <laughs> cops. More cops. <laughs> cops it. actually doing the dispossessing. So we actually um, do have a number of system partners uh, who are doing the front end work, right? We've yeah. trained the judges. They have uniform forms that are coming out they're having relinquishment hearings. They're requiring proof of relinquishment. And then we get to the moment where the judge says, I find that this person has not satisfied the relinquishment requirements. They then forward that along to law enforcement. And that's it. That, it is complicated from that point forward because, okay, now we know that there is an armed prohibited person. How do we go in and actually get our hands on that gun? And I think that the front end of the model that she's talking about is absolutely doable with existing resources. We're doing a ton of it now. Um, I'm super excited to hear her description of it because I agree, I think it's a really great model. There's a similarly wonderful model in the San Diego City Attorney's Office, for example. They have a wonderful team that yeah. um, also works with judges and system partners to identify these individuals. Um, but the moment of disarmament is dangerous and yes. it um, has to be done by somebody with handcuffs. Got it. Doctor, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, so I, I completely agree with that. Um, the one thing that I would add is that in addition to what King County has that I didn't hear the lieutenant talk about is that uh, civil protection orders of different sorts that allow for gun dispossession are sort of lumped under this umbrella coalition. So um, it's not just about gun violence restraining orders, it's also about domestic violence restraining orders. So having that expertise concentrated in that team allows for better efficiencies, both, both on the front end, um, but also on the back end with regard to that dispossession. So just bringing all of those dispossession opportunities under one umbrella team is, is a difference also that I would highlight. Great, thank you. And I sensed we were doing that, am I, am I wrong? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you for your question. Yes, we are doing both. We do, uh, when available, I wanna highlight what Marissa said, we need more people to be able to do more, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but when we can, we do. Always our challenge, yeah. Okay, thank you so much. All right, Council Member Rennes? Not thank you. thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to thank everyone for their presentations and 
um, for the collaboration that is obviously happening behind this, um, the scenes and we get to just benefit from all the really great news even though there was a, a lot of terrible things happening there is um, some wonderful partnerships and collaborations and I think we need to really focus on that and continue to build on those so thank you for for all the work um, my question is and it's going to be no surprise to anyone I'm going to ask about intimate partner violence and how we are uh, tracking the patterns around um, those who are using guns uh, either um, in an intimate partner uh, um, a dispute or incident and those who and, and may have not discharged that that weapon and in incidents that were discharged um, you know we we saw at the beginning at the beginning of the summer how um, children lost their mother um, in the north part of San Jose and I, I believe that there's also an opportunity for us to be proactive about about these patterns um, I think at the top of this presentation uh, and we all know this is that many of the mass shootings are, are, are folks who have had into partner violence and so what are we proactively doing to keep track not only to keep track of it but um uh to make sure that uh those survivors understand their rights um council member arnes if i could just uh, start the response um by saying i really appreciate the question because um it's such an important part of this story about gun violence and we saw that in one of the slides about the linkages between domestic violence um, domestic violence murder suicides and mass shootings one of the things that um, and some of you may know Rolanda Pierre Dixon in the early 1990s she founded our county's domestic violence death review team that San Jose Police Department is a part of and it's a comprehensive effort that is still in existence today to look at every domestic violence death that we have every year and to think about what are the systems issues that um, might have been better or could be created that might have prevented that death and uh, it's 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 difficult work it's hard work to do um, but we're it's an ongoing process and one of the things that I think has uh, grown out of that is um, a real wealth of information and data we have going back to 1992 on every domestic violence death that we've had in our community. Um, so as far as tracking these things, uh, we've been doing it for a while and, and San Jose and Santa Clara County have really been pioneers in that effort. The only thing I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to add uh, one or two more things to that is that uh, one of the things that we do in domestic violence court here um, for every every time someone comes to court and is charged with a domestic violence crime, what the judge does is issues a prote criminal protective order for that victim, and that act of the issuing of the criminal protective order immediately makes that person prohibited from having firearms. And so what we do also immediately at that hearing, we come to the hearing with the information already, does that person have guns? And so the moment they become a prohibited person, we're asking for a gun relinquishment hearing immediately. And it's that timeliness, I think, that um, uh, the San Jose Police Department was talking about in their presentation that is so key, is that you want to, from the moment the person becomes prohibited, immediately start the process of relinquishment. And I think we can do more on the enforcement part of it. Um, I think we can build out our teams to, to be better at enforcing these laws, but especially on the front end, I think we've got a lot of good things in place. I don't know if that answered all the parts of your question, council member. Uh, thank you. It, it, it does satisfy a portion of my question. Um, and, and this was really for our San Jose Police Department, but I really appreciate your, um, your response. And this was for us as, as our for our own purposes to keep track of the patterns um, in terms of when uh, 
how many incidents in the year are, is there a brandishing of a weapon? And how many of those incidents have, um, has that weapon been discharged or not? Um, just the fact that there is a weapon is, is serious. It, it's, a, it's a very serious situation. And we know that that um, person on the other receiving end of this relationship is in real danger. Um, and so this, this is all leading to what, what do we do proactively for those survivors, knowing that these, um, knowing that uh, once somebody has a weapon, like a gun in their possession, um, there's a very high likelihood of, of that gun being eventually used. And so um, I know that we, we just secured some analysts earlier in our budget season. So I wanted to hear maybe from Lieutenant, Lieutenant Donahue or, or Chief, um, how, how are we and how are we preparing ourselves to, how are we making sure that we're going to um, manage these patterns in a way that we can hopefully, um, and I've heard this, this, this expression uh, throughout this presentation from some folks to, to catch some of these upstream. Thank you for your question, council members. This is uh, Steve Donahue from Research and Development. So I, I wanna talk about 15 different things, but I'm gonna try to boil it down. Sarah <laughs> looked at me and said, please don't. Um, so here's what's happening with our department. First off, um, back, back in uh, February, I reported out to the Public Safety Finance and Strategic Support Committee, the use of firearms during domestic violence incidents in 2021. So in 2021, we had 2,962 incidents of domestic violence without a firearm and 24 involving a firearm. So I wanna point that out that we know that there's a, a, a correlation here, but we, we don't have a hugely prevalent problem here in San Jose for this particular issue. That doesn't negate the fact that any, any kind of intimate partner violence in the, involving a firearm is not okay but we, we need to look at this in context. The first thing that we did at our department is we established years ago a threats team in our domestic violence unit, our family violence unit. And they don't look at just the act, but the threat of an act, the potentiality for this to come to fruition. And so they examine each particular case through a lens that looks at, could this happen again? Could it get worse? Or could something happen that we don't know about yet? And by doing that, we're able to kind of head off some of the issues that might be presented later on down the line. On top of that, we put a huge campaign out to educate the officers in our department. And that education is twofold. First of all, it's from us telling them how to do their job better. It's telling them, this is what a GVRO is. This is how to get one. This is how to use one. These are the processes in place to make it easy for you to do so. And then it's asking them to bring that out to the community. We've added um, a box on our domestic violence infield reporting guide that, um, that re requires officers to ask about GVROs. That will go live hopefully soon. I actually sent the memo this morning over to the city attorney's office for approval. So knock on wood, we'll get that out pretty soon. The, um, the report receipts that we give to survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence, intimate partner violence, all have GVRO resources on them. And we also do it verbally. We basically ask in every single instance of domestic violence or intimate partner violence, are there firearms on the premises or does the subject have access to firearms? Not just are they in the house, but can they access them? Maybe they're in their car, maybe they're at a friend's house, maybe they're stored at a storage locker. Well, we want to know that information. We put out a training bulletin on this fact already this year. And uh, so you know, I'm, I'm talking quickly here, council member, but basically to answer your question, we're doing a lot. We're not done. We're not perfect. But I will tell you that we are very much aware of this, this problem and we are doing everything we can to combat it at our intimate level here in San Jose. Right, and, and, and I appreciate your response, Lieutenant Donahue. I, I, I... I appreciate the that report in February, although we're always looking back at some of this information and part of this is is to be um, like some folks expressed upstream of this issue. 
Um, and so part of it is we've are, we're, we're counting the deaths after they happen. Um, and whether those are 24 or five, they're, they're, those are absolutely underreported in terms of, of what is happening in, in that household throughout the whole year and what those children, um, if there are children in the household, what they're witnessing and, and the cycle of abuse that continues to happen. And so for me, um, uh, this is part of what I would like to see in our San Jose Police Department. This is set, maybe separate from this conversation now, but I think it's it's a good opportunity for us to bring it up. And that is to also um, look at these patterns of how, you know, if there are X amount of uh, uh, uses of a firearm within an incident of domestic violence that those folks are, you know, that, that there is something a little bit more proactive other than with our um, service providers in terms of bringing those folks in and other uh, peripheral services that can help that and support and stabilize that family rather than waiting um, for this, you know, uh, and I realize 24 deaths is not, um, it, it doesn't point to a crisis, but it points to 24 families in the city of San Jose have lost, um, typically it is a mother that that is in that um, position, or that they have lost both parents because it's a murder suicide, um, and so the, this is this is a great um, launch pad for me to for us to continue to talk about the analysts that will that are going to go to um, some of some of our investigative units and how do we use those analysts to continue to be um, upstream. Um, of this information rather than looking back and seeing what those patterns are, but in, in, in uh, current time, being able to be um, proactive. I know we can't being in all of uh, the households in San Jose, but it is part of what we need to do in order to take a look at the patterns and see the bigger picture. I hear you. Uh, I hear you. Um, and I'm, I'm actually done. Uh, but this, I think, no, this actually, council member, to, to talk about in terms of data. Mm -hmm. Council member, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to talk over you. I actually wanted to uh, correct a miscommunication. I, I, I think uh, there was a misunderstanding. There, there were not 24 deaths. Lieutenant, did you want to describe? Uh, thank you, sir. It's 24 incidents in the in the fiscal year of 2021. There is, there's been six firearm related intimate partner violence deaths between 2017 and 2021. That was 24 incidents, not the same as death. Okay. And then, um, oh, I apologize. I apologize. I, I misheard that. Um, we, we also uh, wanted to I, mention that we have a new family violence analyst coming on board who's going to be yes. able to help us focus on the lethality assessments and those threats that we find on the back end of family violence mm -hmm. incidents. Mm -hmm. I, no, I appreciate that. That's something that that we definitely um, have been fighting for 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 some time. Um, because if we can't see the bigger picture, we can't um, sort some of these details out. the The other piece that I I'd like to also bring uh, some light to, and this is part of what we've been seeing in the Mayor's Gang Task Force, is that there's an increase in female participation um, in uh, violent behavior, and uh, research has shown that that typically the reason why females um, uh, are involved in the juvenile justice system is because of sexual assault. And so I think that's also an opportunity for us to take a look um, at how this is impacting um, women and men differently. Um, it, men are the ones that are using the guns and typically um, other than mass shootings, maybe uh, women are on the other end, of the receiving end of those of those guns, and so I think that we need to be proactive with with the gender based programming that we have for abuse intervention. And lastly, I just want to say that there is some really wonderful work that's happening out of our PRNS, our Parks and Rec and Neighborhood Services, and Lighter Library Department for a master um, uh, a, ma a child and yet master youth plan that is not only taking a look at the continuum of services internally in the city of San Jose and the age bracket that goes along, the different ages that go along with that, but 
we're also looking at they're also looking and we're, we're going to do this through we're doing this through nsc our neighborhood services and education committee we're looking at the whole system and how the county how we fit into this continuum of services uh for for children and youth and so i think this is uh, a really good opportunity for us also to talk about gun violence okay and integrate that into the, leave it there. the master plan Thank you, Councilmember. We're going to leave it there because uh, we're we're out of time. I, I really want to thank both all the experts who offered their great insights from afar uh, and the other coasts, uh, as well as our experts right here at home who've been working so hard uh, to help reduce gun violence. We know we have a lot of work to do, but it's really impressive what's already being done, and I just want to commend that. We have several members of the community who may like to speak. Claire Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. Uh, thanks for the meeting here. Um, boy, you kind of went had a very nice uh, overview of uh, a constructive overview of the different ways to talk about uh, gun use in the future of San Jose. I hope that it can be examples of uh, constructive purposes uh, in how a city government works to address its gun issues, and that can be taken to heart by all parts of our community. Perhaps a bit more uh, discussion could have been on domestic violence. Uh, thank you to Councilperson Arenas and to the concepts of uh, oversight. I think to, uh, to have offered the concepts of how oversight could play into all of this into our future would be an important element that would please, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, certain parts of our community that we're trying to uh, we're trying to bring in a, a whole community process, I think. Uh, you, you've obviously built a constructive, really good parts you've shown today, thank you. Uh, good luck how to really bring in that other part of the community. I think it's really important how we address, you know, the Trump era and what they have uh, put to ourselves and what they want, what they, how they wanna be a part of the process. It is really up to us how to bring in that process and make it a, a shared process. And I think we can do it with progressive, uh, peace-loving ideas uh, that are that are well-reasoned. And, and if we do that, that's how we bring in a whole process. Good luck to your efforts to do that and this sort of item. Thanks. Back to the council. All right, thank you again uh, to all those who did, uh, committed their time so generously. And thank you particularly to Sarah and Peter for, for organizing this really impressive panel. Uh, that means adjourned.